The Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Ivan Van Sertima. The Moor in Africa and Europe, Ivan Van Sertima. 1. Origins and Definitions It is generally assumed that the movement of Africans into Europe in significantly large numbers and into positions of real power did not occur until the Muslim invasion of Spain in 711 AD. In al makaris history of the Mohammedan dynasties in Spain, however, we learn of a great drought that afflicted Spain about 3,000 years ago, a catastrophe that was followed not long afterwards by an invasion from Africa. This, of course, had nothing to do with the medieval Moors, with which this book is primarily concerned, but it is worth noting here because it actually established an ancient African dynasty in Spain a fact that is omitted from the official histories. The drought that devastated Spain, however, is described by a number of Spanish historians. Pedro de Medina, in Libro de las Grandezas de España, published in Seville in 1549, dates the drought at 1070 B.C. Ibn Khattab al makari in his major historical work translated by Pascal de Gallangos, describes it in some detail. It is al makari also who informs us of how Africans banished from North Africa by an African king against whom they revolted entered Spain and took control of that country. The leader of the Africans is recorded as Batricus. What his original name was we do not know but it survives as Batricus in the Latin of the Romans because it was the Romans who defeated these Africans 157 years later. These Africans first cast anchor at a place on the western shore of Spain and settled at Cadiz. Advancing into the interior of the country, they spread themselves about, extended their settlements, built cities and towns and increased their numbers by marriage. They settled in that part of the country between the place of their landing in the west and the country of the Franks in the east, and appointed kings to rule over them and administer their affairs. They fixed their capital at Telaca, Italica, a city now in ruins, which once belonged to the district of Isbilla, which is modern Seville. But after a period of 157 years, during which eleven kings of the African race reigned over Andalus, they were annihilated by the Romans, who invaded and conquered the country. The second major intrusion of an African army into Spain before the Moors occurs sometime around 700 BC during the period of the 25th dynasty in Egypt when the Ethiopian Taharqa was a young general but before he had been seated the throne by his uncle Shabataka. It is this same Taharqa referred to in early Spanish chronicles as Taraco that led a garrison into Spain and invaded it during this period. We have a clear and indisputable reference to this in a manuscript by Florian D. Ocampo, Cronica General, published in Medina del Campo in 1553. The name of the invading general is given as Taraco. He is not only identified as head of the Ethiopian army. The reference is more specific. It says he was later to become a king of Egypt. The name, the period, the historical fact of his generalship and his later kingship of Egypt, his Ethiopian origin, and the wide-ranging trade and exploration of the Ethiopian in this period all attest to the validity of this reference. But most persuasive of all is the fact that cartouches of the upper Egyptian kings of this period have been found in Spain. Evidence of such cartouches may be found in the Journal of Epigraphic Society, Volume 7, number 171, April 1979. The cartouche of Shishong, a Libyan king, was found in tomb 16, Al-Munikar, Spain. The Libyans ruled with the support of Nubian armies from the 22nd to the 24th dynasties and were overthrown by the Nubians in the 25th. The fact that Africans from the north had been intruding into southern Europe from very early times should not come as a great surprise, for the straits that separate the two continents can be crossed by the simplest boats in a matter of hours. 
the proximity of the borders of Europe and Africa, and the evidence of the African phenotype among many Southern Europeans led Napoleon to remark that Africa begins at the Pyrenees. Many historians, however, make clear-cut distinctions between the early North Africans and the Africans of the Sahara. They contend that the Africans who made contact and left their mark on Europe should not be confused with the sub-Saharan African type. They see these people as Euro-Africans, another version of the brown Mediterranean race myth used to account for the genius of ancient Egypt. Since many North Africans in modern times seem to fit into this theoretical construct, it has worked very well to confuse and confound the definition of their ethnicity. Some of our contributors, although well grounded in their particular areas of expertise, are vague about the origins of the North African tribes and the complex of historical factors that have transformed the cultural and physical configuration of these people. This has compelled me to use my editorial mandate and overview to bring what I hope is a more decisive clarity to this matter. The people whom the classical Greek and Roman authors called Berber were mainly black and affiliated with the then contemporary peoples of the East African area. The word Berber was used in fact to refer to peoples of the Red Sea area in Africa as well as North Africans. It was an ancient belief that the nomads dwelling in the deserts of Arabia were the same peoples whose ancestors had in earlier times roamed the deserts of East Africa. It was such populations that largely comprised the Moorish people, called Moors, from the Greek Moris, the Roman Moris, or Dark, because of the attribute of blackness which sharply distinguished them from the bulk of the European people. However, the inhabitants of present-day North Africa are considered ethnically and culturally distinct from people dwelling south of the Sahara. This is only so today because of the considerable influx of European types during the white slave trade and their later movement in positions of dominance after the defeat of the Moors. The 700 years during which the Moors dominated the Iberian Peninsula was an era in which many Europeans came into North Africa in states of servitude. The Muslims brought millions of European slaves over to the North African parts of Sail, Tangier, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, Fez, and Marrakesh, and some of the northern Egyptian towns. One very famous sultan, Moulay Ismail of Mekemes in Morocco, had as many as 25,000 European slaves who participated in the building of his colossal stables. Sudanese were also taken into slavery, but before the 15th century, not as many as the whites. It was these Europeans who began to modify through intermixture the earlier black inhabitants of North Africa. This is what eventually made so many North Africans appear different from the sub-Saharan Africans. The anthropologist Dana Reynolds, in an exhaustive and meticulously detailed essay, has attempted to trace the African roots of the original North African peoples. She cites half a dozen Greek and Byzantine Neo-Roman writers from the 1st to the 6th century AD who describe the Berber population of North Africa as black-skinned. Among these writers are Marshall, Silas Italicus, Chloripus, and Procopius. The original black Berbers, who were called Moors, were the North African ancestors of the present-day dark brown and brown black peoples of the Sahara and the Sahel, mainly those called Fulani, Tuareg, Zenaga of southern Morocco, Kunta, and Tibu of the Sahel countries, as well as other black Arabs now living in Mauritania and throughout the Sahel. They include the Traraza of Mauritania and Senegal, the Magharba as well as dozens of other Sudanese tribes, the Chaamba of Chad and Algeria. Apart from her very detailed study of the origins and affiliations of the various tribes, she points out that the Africans involved in the Moorish occupation of Iberia did not just build remarkable things in Europe but also in their native lands. 
they founded and constructed many industrious and prosperous towns all over the north of Africa and as far south as Timbuktu. The ruins of their many castles can be seen as much in North Africa as in Andalusia. The evidence Reynolds presents to establish the Africoid base of the Berbers is challenged by Wayne Chandler, who insists that the Berbers were already heavily mixed with a Caucasoid element before the Moorish invasion. They were classified as the Tawny Moors and are to be distinguished, says he, from the Black Moors. They are the result of mixing of black Africans, the Garamantes of the Sahara, with a race of white Libyans. This clash of views has led to a stimulating debate. Let me state the case as presented by both contestants. At the heart of the history of the ancient Moors, says Chandler, are the Garamantes of the Sahara. The Garamantes were black Africans who occupied much of northern Africa. They can be considered the ancestors of the true Moors. Contemporary with the Garamantes were the Libyans, originally claimed Chandler. These Libyans, whom Menes attacked and defeated in the first dynasty, were Caucasians. They were called by their black conquerors Tamahu. In Egyptian, Tama means people and Hu is white or light ivory. Thus, they were the white or light-skinned people. Portraits of the battle between Menes and these people indicate, according to Chandler, that they were a different race from the ancient dark-skinned Egyptian. These light-skinned people intermarried with the many blacks on all sides of them, he claims, and became the Tawny Moors or White Moors, also known as Berber from the Roman Barbari or Barbarian. The Arabs adopted this Roman term for them and changed it to Berber. Eventually the word Libyan and Berber became synonymous in some places. The Sahara, he contends, came to be occupied by two distinct groups, the original Moors, Garamantes, and the Berbers, who later became the Tawny or White Moors. The rest of North Africa, from Egypt through the Fezan, and the west of the Sahara to what is now called Morocco and Algeria were peopled by black Africans, also called Moors by the Romans and the later Europeans. Eventually these Moors would join with Arabs to become a united and powerful force. Names like Tamahu, Dana Reynolds points out in a lengthy correspondence with me, while originally used for indigenous Libyans, came to be used for the foreign colonists and mercenaries. For the Egyptian artist, such names apparently possessed only geographical or national significance rather than ethnic or racial meaning. The earliest portrayals of Tamahu, however, rule out the idea that the word meant ivory or white-skinned people, as Chandler claims. A similar claim had been made for the earlier Libyan name Tahinu, but as O. Bates and more recently Vichtil point out, both of these names were first applied to men portrayed in Egyptian iconography with dark brown skins, and they were obviously of a different race and culture than the later blonde invaders. F. Berens, A. Arkell, and several other specialists in the archaeology of Nubia and the southeastern Sahara have come to see the C group culture as the population which was first designated Tamahu in the 6th dynasty. They were a relatively tall, slender, and obviously black population of pastoral nomads who came to settle in Nubia. The tombs they used belonged to the Berber kind found all over ancient North Africa. This type of man was, judging from the skeletal evidence and eyewitness accounts of early European historians, the predominant population of North Africa, even at the time of the first Arab penetration into North Africa. See Chandler's response in appendix to this editorial. In his discussion of Berber ethnic origins, Jose Pimenta Bay cites the views of Sheikh Anta Jop on the matter of the Moors and the Berbers, 
However, Jolt is not particularly helpful. It is refreshing that Bay sees this very clearly and qualifies his support. Although he cites the master with respect, he does not follow him. Jop makes the unsupportable claim that the Berbers were post-Islamic invaders. His uncharacteristically uninformed commentary on the Moors led me to delete that section of his otherwise remarkable paper, which it was my honor to read at the Nile Valley Conference held in Atlanta in 1984. On the poor state of mathematics and astronomy in Europe at the time of the invasion, Jup was his usually perceptive self, but he must have mixed up time levels in a hurried look at the Berber. Sources on the Moors also seem to be rather sparse in French. It is possible that General Martel's defeat of the Moors and their virtual expulsion from France may account for this. Professor Latfi of Morocco University, whom Bay also cites, in no way proves the contention that the Berber and the Moor are synonymous terms. They probably were, but it is certainly not established by any of Latfi's arguments, which indicate an Africoid element but considerable ethnic diversity among the Berbers. Such contradictions can only be resolved by concentration on specific time levels and an ability to demonstrate conclusively how this web of ethnic threads sprang from a single node. Only Reynolds offers this type of concentrated argument and documentation. Bay, however, provides the most wide-ranging and well-researched thesis done so far to establish the great debt Europe owes to Moorish scholarship. The essay of Runoko Rashidi and James Brunson provides us with one of the most comprehensive examinations of the use of the word more, but they concede that it is still difficult to arrive at the precise ethnicity of a more through mere terminology alone. The fact that the term was originally intended to refer to a black or dark-skinned person, as they have shown, does not mean that everyone called a Moor is African or of African descent. The Arabs themselves rarely used the term Moor. They often used the term Berber for the non-Arabian people of Northwest Africa with whom they came in contact and who joined with them in the invasion of Europe. The early Christians also used the term Saracen indiscriminately to cover both Moors as well as other Muslim populations in general. Readers of the recent popular edition of The Moors in Spain by Stanley Lane Poole will seldom find references to color but a frequent use of the word Saracen. The Moors, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, are people who are commonly supposed to be black or very dark and it is synonymous with the word for Negro in many contexts. Rashidi and Brunson provide numerous examples of the synonymity of Moor with Black during the European Renaissance and earlier. The word runs like a ripple across a vast pool of languages. During the European Renaissance, explorers, writers, and scholars begin to apply the term Moor to Blacks in general. A prominent example of this tendency can be found in the work of Richard Hakluyt, a 15th century traveler. Hakluyt recorded that in old times the people of Africa were called Ethiops and Negrite, which we now call Moors, Morans, or Negroes. In the Romance languages, Spanish, French, and Italian of medieval Europe, Moor was translated as Moro, Moar and more. Derivatives of the word more may be found even today in these same languages. In Spanish, for example, the word for blackberry is mora, a noun which originally meant Moorish woman. Also in Spanish, the adjective for dark complexion, which now means brunette, is moreno. We find a similar legacy in the French language. In French, moricard means dark-skinned or blackamore, while morillon means black grape. Again, as in Spanish, the Italian word mora means negro or Moorish female. Also in Italian, mora means blackberry, while moreola means black olive.
As pointed out above, the Arabs rarely used this word. In Arabic literature, the word Moor was fairly non-existent, and the term Berber was applied to practically all the inhabitants of the Maghrib, Islamic North Africa, west of Egypt. The Arab use of the word Berber presents further difficulty since the term embraces many clans, not all of whom are black. It is because of this that Rashidi and Brunson, as well as the anthropologist Dana Reynolds, have gone to the trouble in certain contexts to identify those Berber clans of Africoid or predominantly Africoid origin. The most important identifier, of course, is to be found in medieval painting and sculpture. It is claimed that certain Islamic traditions inhibited the representation of the human image in the work of Muslim artists and even in cases some medieval Persian art for example, where this inhibition does not seem to have obliterated portrait art. The human image is often frozen, non-individualistic and unreal. We are grateful, therefore, that in spite of their prejudices, the Christians left vivid images of the Muslim black. While the black figure at times takes on a demonic quality or emerges as an exaggerated caricature of the African, these paintings and sculptures are an indisputable witness to his presence and importance in this period. Such illustrations are to be found in the Cantigas of Santa Maria, allegedly written by Alfonso X, 1254 to 1286. They are filled with images of the Moor and are mostly black types. This is the period of the Almoravid invasion, which brought hordes of new Africans into the Iberian Peninsula. Medieval illustrators in the Cantigas portray blacks in a variety of roles, from members of the aristocracy to the military. Included among the images of medieval Spain is a black man receiving gifts from a caliph or emir. In another illustration, two noble black moors are shown playing chess while being attended by black and white servants and musicians. Also, in the army of the Almoravid, black moors are shown not only as foot soldiers, bowmen, lancers, and horsemen, but high-ranking officers. This needs to be emphasized since historians have repeatedly presented blacks in these contexts as mere palace guards, harem keepers, and muscle-mounted mercenaries. Let us not pretend, however, that racism just rolled over and died when it was struck by the lightning of Islam. There were more positive black images, to be sure, in the Quran than in the Bible, far more black figures emerging as supreme powers in Islamic lands than in the lands of European Christendom. God created man of black clay, says the Quran, and the scandalous story of the curse of Ham, which gave so many bigots an almost divine justification for despising blacks, had no place in the Islamic scriptures. Where in the legend of the early Christian world could we find figures like the black general Ubadah, who commanded the surrender of Egypt from Europeans, or a revered black like Bilal among the first companions of the prophet, a third pillar of the faith, who brought the infidel forces of Syria to their knees, Search as hard as you may through the Christian pantheon of heroes and you will never find the likes of Yaqub ibn Yusuf, also known as Al-Mansur, who ruled Morocco from 1149 to 1189 and invaded Andalusia twice, becoming one of the greatest of the Moorish rulers of Spain. And on what throne in Europe, save in the Muslim domains, sits one comparable to Ibrahim al-Mahadi, black poet and musician who became ruler of Syria in 686 AD and was elected 25 years later as caliph of all Muslim Spain. As St. Clair Drake points out, making a very serious qualitative distinction, the election by elders of a black to rule all of Muslim Spain makes this, in spite of the presence of color prejudice which Islam mediated but could not obliterate, very different from the system of color caste that would eventually develop in the New World diaspora. What led to this qualitative difference? According to Professor Drake, the cultures conquered by the Muslims adopted the Arabic language along with the Muslim religion and thus contributed to an international Arabic culture 
that was distinct from an Arabian culture characteristic of the Arabian Peninsula. This international Islamic high culture had a tendency to transform color prejudice into an attitude that was subordinated to other values. Islam modified racial prejudices. It did not eradicate it. In Islam, as in Christianity, there has always been tension between its universalistic teachings and its application in concrete situations. The kind of social relations that existed in specific time and places in Arabia, rather than abstract conceptions of color values, were the decisive determinants of concepts about black people and attitudes toward them. Specific times and places rather than abstract conceptions. This is very well put and brings clarity to a situation that is sometimes irritatingly ambiguous. How can the black rise to the top of the world in some places, while in others apparently dominated by the same general conception? He is paralyzed and stifled. There are zones of relative mobility, as in Spain, which Drake calls the periphery, and zones of relative rigidity, as in Persia and Turkey, which are seen as the central lands. Even in liberalized Spain, however, there was the problem of race. But was it simply race or the rivalry between power groups? Rashidi and Brunson note the so-called bias of the Arabs. With the conquest and settlement of Spain, they contend the Arabs developed patterns of racial bias towards the Berbers. This bias, sometimes blatant and at other times more subtle, manifested in various ways. They cite disproportionate tax assessment and poor land allotments, but they give an even more disturbing example of racial bigotry. After founding the Almohad dynasty, the Berber ruler Abd al-Mumin offered the post of secretary in Grenada to an Arab poet, Abu Ghaffar. Because Ghaffar had to work beside the black sultan's son, he hesitated because he felt the dark-skinned Berber was far below his own intellectual standards. One can well understand how this asinine arrogance led to hostile feelings, open rebellions, and shifting allegiances between the Arab, Berber, and Christian factions of the Iberian Peninsula. This essay presents us also with a portrait of the Christian Moor, St. Maurice, and concludes with an introduction to the African presence in early Arabia, highlighting the African substratum of the ancient Arab world. 2. Influences and Contributions A distinction should be drawn between the classical renaissance of Europe, which mainly relates to its literature and art, and the scientific renaissance, which began to bud and flower in the 12th and 13th centuries. Jose Pimenta Bay deals primarily with the Moorish stimulus for the latter. He sets out to prove in his essay, and does so with a formidable body of evidence, that the foundation of much of medieval Western science and its academies was built up upon the transmissions, refinements, and discoveries of the Arabs and the Moors. Moorish influence came primarily to the West by the way of the Iberian Peninsula, renamed Al-Andalus by the Moors. Bay provides us with a detailed examination of Western Europe's scholarly relations with Spain. Translation, of course, played the major role in this diffusion of the sciences. The schools of translation were like the bridges between the Muslim and Christian scholars. Chief among these was the school of translators founded at Toledo by Alfonso X during the 13th century. Translations from Arabic, the medieval language of science, into Latin, the classical European language, had been going on since the 10th century. Centers of translation sprang up all over Christian Europe. Barcelona, Tarazona, Leon, Segovia, Pamplona, Toulouse, Béziers, Narbonne, Marseille, Bologna, Salerno, and Paris made extensive use of Moorish scientific treatises. The translations from the Arabic provided links between Spain, Portugal, France, Italy, and England. Alfonso X promoted Moorish erudition at every opportunity. 
the first university of Christian Spain was founded at Valencia by Alfonso VIII in the 13th century and the teachers employed were the Muslims and the Jews. Nearly all the major universities in Europe sprung up around the same time, beginning in the second half of the 12th century right up through the 13th, a span of about 150 years, a period which coincides with the flowering of Moorish science and the establishment of centers in Europe to translate Moorish treatises from Arabic into Latin. In Italy we have Bologna, Padua, Naples, Rome, in France Montpellier and Toulouse, in Portugal Lisbon and Coimbra, in England Oxford. Several of the Moorish works in mathematics, astronomy and medicine became standard text at these universities. For example, Judwal, a Moorish work in astronomy, became a standard text at Oxford. Frederick II founded a university at Naples in 1224 and there he established a curriculum which emphasized Moorish scholarship. Under him all theological studies ceased at Italian universities and Moorish medicine and law became the major disciplines. A curious schizophrenia developed among the Catholics in relation to Moorish science and knowledge. On the one hand, they were very much aware of the superior knowledge of the Moors and they made efforts to acquire that knowledge so that they would not be left too far behind. At the same time, they strove desperately to keep it away from the common people and even at times to vilify it so that it would not become a challenge to Catholicism. They were afraid that the Enlightenment, the new ideas that this new knowledge would bring, could affect the populace, so that even though they were given the keys to the inner sanctum, they kept the cage closed to the masses. Into Europe came the great advances of an empire more immense than those of either Alexander the Great or Rome at its height. Rice was introduced into Europe by the Moors in the 10th century, cotton by the 9th. A Moorish botanist, Ibn Basal, partitioned the land into 10 different classes according to particular characteristics and taught the farmers ways of increasing the fertility of their plots. Surveys were done to locate sweet water below the earth. Widespread use was made of the water wheel which the Moors had introduced into Spain. The Romans also knew of this but they had used it very little. The Moors also dug canals and channels to irrigate the farmlands and provide water for the thousands of houses and mosques and palaces and public baths. They not only increased the fertility of the soil with their new methods and tools and plants and measures, but they also ushered in the sciences of food preservation and storage. They could store wheat for as long as 100 years. Their methods of drying enabled such food as figs, plums, cherries, and apples to remain edible for several years. They have left the voice print of their language on the things they introduced. A lot of Arabic words have entered general usage as a result of the Moorish invasion of Europe. Bay sites, coffee, sugar, rice, cotton, lemon, syrup, soda, alcohol, alkali, cipher, algebra, arsenal, admiral, alcove, magazine. Let me add a few to this list selected from my own work on pre-Columbian navigation and the transfer of plants. Anchor from Angar, Caravel from Caravos, Tobacco from Dubak, and series of Taba and Tagba words. Also the technical terms for Astrolab, an astronomical device invented by the Moors, still retain their Arabic names. But technology in itself is not the only arbiter of civilization. It is important to note a benign African influence on the way Islam operated in Spain, particularly in relationship to women. Ibn Battuta, the Arab traveler and writer, first commented with astonishment on the level of freedom and equality of Muslim women in the African town of Walata. It was the same in Moorish Spain. Unique among Islamic nations, women enjoyed more societal freedoms than in any part of the Islamic world. They moved freely in public and engaged in various gatherings. The practice of purda was almost entirely ignored in Moorish Spain. Even a daughter of a 12th century caliph had a total disregard for the veil. 
A question that has always haunted me is the reason for Europe's dark age. Why did Europe fall into such darkness after all it had received from the Greeks who had taken so much and added what they could to the Egyptian sciences? George G. M. James in The Stolen Legacy answers this question. James had pointed out that the edicts of Theodosius in the 4th century closed down the temples of the Egyptian mysteries as well as the philosophical schools of Greece. The Emperor Justinian in 529 AD followed in the same path of Theodosius. Thus an intellectual darkness descended over Christian Europe and the entire Greco-Roman world. It lasted for centuries. But I feel James exaggerates when he claims that, quote, the Greeks showed no creative powers and were unable to improve on the knowledge they received, end quote. His point about their borrowings is well made, but this kind of chauvinistic remark is quite unnecessary. There is no need to suggest the Greeks were dumb and could make no improvements, whatever, on what they learned. If that were true, the influence of the Egyptians would have been negligible. But James makes an even more important point, which I have not seen repeated elsewhere. It is the missing link in the drama of Moorish scientific ascendancy in the Middle Ages. Eurocentric historians had argued that the Arabs were merely transmitting the Greek heritage lost to Europe during its Dark Age. Even Arabs were made to believe that and to assume that they were standing on the shoulders of Greek giants. By the time they attacked Egypt, Europeans had long been in charge of that defeated country. The Arabs seemed to forget that their conquest of Egypt had been made easy by the resentment of the Egyptians against their Byzantine overlords. We know far more today about the enormous debt Greek science owes to Egypt. See my essay, The Egyptian Precursor, in this issue. But what was little suspected was that Greece was not the only conduit of Egyptian scientific genius to the Arab world. James provides evidence that there were Egyptians fleeing their country in large numbers during the Persian, Greek, and Roman invasions, fleeing not only to the desert and mountain regions, but also to adjacent lands in Africa, Arabia, and Asia Minor, where they lived and secretly developed the teachings which belonged to their mystery system. In the 8th century AD, the Moors of North Africa invaded Spain and took with them the Egyptian culture which they had preserved. Knowledge in the ancient days was centralized, that is, it belonged to a common parent and system, the wisdom system or mysteries of Egypt, which the Greek used to call Sophia. Whatever we may say of these great scientific advances, there is something that we cannot gloss over and which unfortunately we must mention in our uncompromising quest for the truth of history. Some despots and merchants did trade in slaves during part of the Moorish occupation of Al-Andalus. Most of these before the European slave trade were European slaves. It has been said that slavery among the Muslims and slavery among the Catholics had important differences. Bay quotes Joseph O. Callahan, who, in the history of medieval Spain, makes it clear that, quote, owners did not possess the power of life and death over them, nor could they inflict excessive punishment. Slaves had rights, and they could actually seek assistance if they were exceedingly maltreated. On this matter, Bay comments, any student of American history knows that this was far from the case regarding the British and United States system of enslavement. The enslaved African was a non-human legally designated as property. Slavery, regardless of these qualifications, can never be condoned or forgiven. But it was not central to their system. It was marginal. I think it should be also pointed out contrary to myths about the Muslims, that they did not force their religion down the throats of the Christians. John Jackson, in an informative chapter on the Moors in his book, Introduction to African Civilization, shows us how Christian, Jew, and Muslim were treated with equal respect during the dynasty of the Umayyads. We have been given no evidence that this changed dramatically in later Muslim dynasties. The slave trade in this time was not a state institution. It was like the lucrative drug enterprise of today, a large but lawless thing.
sometimes indulged in by bad rulers, but not a keystone of the system, as it was later to become in the Euro-Christian world. The Moors, let it be said, did not suppress the languages of the people of Al-Andalus. They did not outlaw their sacred customs. They did not turn Iberia into a sweatshop, its fertile lands a mere source of raw materials for the Muslim international elite. They did not destroy their legal system, rob them of their political rights, deny their claim to humanity. The one thing they did insist on was a say in the election of the Catholic bishops, since the rival power of the church could undermine Muslim power and authority. The world changed dramatically in 1492, not only because Columbus stumbled in the direction of the Americas, using the magnet of a myth to draw millions behind him, but because that was the very year the Moors were defeated. It is not an accident that it is Spain and Portugal who spearheaded the movement in this direction. It was on January 2, 1492, that the African leader, Abu Abdi La, otherwise known as Bobadil, surrendered to the Spanish. Jan Carew compares the illiteracy of the Christian Europeans to the learning and erudition of the Moors of that time. The comparison is so startling, his comment is worth quoting. At a time when the most insignificant provinces of Moorish Spain contained libraries running into thousands of volumes, the cathedrals, monasteries, and palaces of Leon, under Christian rule, numbered books only by the dozen. The paltry number of texts the Christians did possess were almost all devotional or liturgical. The narrowness of vision this produced among leaders of the church and state was to have catastrophic effects. It led to the massive burning of African and Arab books under the ordinal of Cardinal Jimenez de Cisneros. It inspired a similar bonfire of the books of the Native Americans. Bishop de Landa exhorted his followers in the Yucatan, Burn them all. They are works of the devil. The destruction of the Moorish libraries was particularly vicious because it was not only inspired by religious narrowness and bigotry. Hatred of the dark invaders kindled the bonfires. The church at the time too saw most of this foreign learning as something evil, even demonic. The number system that we use today, for example, brought in by the Moors from India, was seen as late as the 17th century in some parts of Europe as signs of the devil. It became a religious mission for men like Jimenez and his successors to erase from history all memory of the Moors. Jimenez even induced the Spanish sovereigns to outlaw the public baths, making cleanliness antithetical to godliness. Fortunately for the scientific renaissance, key Moorish works had already been translated and circulated, even smuggled secretly into the academies, significant seminal inventions introduced and established before these barbaric attempts at an intellectual holocaust. Beaten into surrender, forced by the millions to seek refuge back into Africa and Arabia, some of the Moors still held their ground. An important rebellion by the Moors is cited by Karu in 1568, led by Mulavi Abd Allah Mohammed ibn Umayyah. This was such a serious rebellion that Philip II of Spain had to call on Don Juan of Portugal to put it down. Karu deals with the subtle evasions by Europeans who refused to admit that the Almoravids, 1056 to 1147, were Africans. They continued to describe them variously as descended from the Sanhaja tribes of the Sahara or the Desert Sanhaja from whom the Almoravids had first drawn support, suggesting that Almoravids themselves were of a different race and that they got the Sanhaja to help in their campaign or the African troops the Sanhaja. While he notes that the Arabs later developed a myopic vision of history, ignoring the African contribution, he praises the early Muslim open-mindedness. For, after all, Islam went beyond the Arab, and in its early revolutionary phase, its eagerness to embrace the universe of man's imaginings was extraordinary. Unlike Christian theologians who forbade scholars from considering ideas outside of the prescribed ecclesiastical canons of the day, Islam accommodated new ideas with grace and a civilized tolerance. 
let me quote from him again since he highlights the advantages of this kind of dynamic openness very well. Muslim scholars absorbed and synthesized and expanded upon the knowledge of the Ethiopians and Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Chinese, and the Indians. A new and momentous leap forward in the theoretical and applied sciences evidenced itself in Moorish mathematics, medicine, astronomy, navigation, and new concepts of world geography and philosophy. The popularity of Moorish scholarship was such that for centuries Arabic was commonly accepted as the language of scholars from Europe, Asia, and Africa. His essay is particularly illuminating when it comes to the discussion of agriculture. The Moors transformed the Iberian Peninsula in this respect. They were able to create a harmony in the rhythms of the life in the city and in the countryside. They not only brought advanced drainage and irrigation systems, reservoirs, aqueducts, sophisticated storage facilities and efficient marketing, transportation and trading networks, but they brought the beauty and freshness of the countryside into the cities. Fantastic gardens, parks, lush inner courtyards and a constant supply of pure water. They also brought a variety of new crops like cereals, beans and peas of various types olives, almonds, and vines, rich new sources of protein. Fruits unknown to Europe tumbled into the market. Oranges, pomegranates, bananas, coconuts, maize, and rice. They brought the art of dry farming as well to the high bleak plains and they introduced the water wheel, as I mentioned earlier, an invaluable source of energy for irrigation and the grinding of grain. The impact of the Moors upon European literature and upon the work of great writers like Cervantes and Shakespeare is also rarely discussed. Carew points out that Spain's greatest literary figure, Cervantes, was for several years prisoner of a Moorish leader in North Africa. The tales of knight errantry and courtly love which obsess Cervantes' hero, Don Quixote, were filtered through centuries of the Moorish Islamic experience. There were Moorish brotherhoods that may be described as orders of knights. Their imprint on European heraldry, on shields and emblems of chivalry is dealt with elsewhere in this work. Now Shakespeare, though he never traveled, had many merchant friends from whom he could milk information about Morocco and the Moors. He also knew Queen Elizabeth's ambassador to Morocco and the Moroccan ambassador to London. Shakespeare also, I should point out, read Leo Africanus' Geographical History of Africa and quotes actual sentences from this in his play on Othello, The Moor. He wrote an ode to his Moorish mistress, Lucy Morgan of Clerkenwell, and seems to have taken a greater interest in the black figure than any other English dramatist of consequence. Carew touches on his treatment of these, from the noble Moor Othello to the caricature of the black slave, Caliban, round whom the racist prejudices of Elizabethan England are crystallized, to the dark-complexioned prince of Morocco, whose color is cancelled out, in his rivalry with the pink prince of Aragon for the hand of Portia, by what Shakespeare sees as the grand equalizer, wealth and class. The image of the Moor in European literature, however, an occasional though powerfully evocative figure in the plays, novels, and canvases of major European writers and painters, seems rather minimal in its effect on literary or artistic structure and form. Not so in the matter of music. The influence of African and Arab musical instruments, poetry and song, even musical theory on the melodies and rhythms of Spain, shine through the lies and evasions of musicologists to this day. Yusef Ali, drawing upon a comprehensive body of work on this subject, tries to set the record straight. A major misconception about African music is that it has always been separable from what became the Arab-speaking countries of Maghrib, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and the Sudan. The tendency of most people, even scholars who should know better to confuse ancient and modern social and ethnic reality, has led to serious misunderstandings about racial and cultural origins of the people of North Africa as compared with Africans in other parts of the continent. The Maghrib is seen as a thin finger of Islamic culture that stretches from Egypt to the Atlantic. 
and what it was before the advent of Islam or the European slave trade is ignored or forgotten. We shall not attempt to prove here, since we have done so definitively in other volumes, that Egypt, in the classical dynasties at least, was predominantly African. But what is seldom recognized is the African substratum of ancient Egyptian music. This music was to spread and influence both the Eastern and Western world. It haunted and startled the Arab, even as he was startled by the pyramids and sphinxes and colossal monolith which in his desert habitat he had never seen. Experiments in ancient Egypt with a music notation system and the establishment of schools of music that not only taught vocal and instrumental performance, but also theory and chironomy, the art of notation by means of gesture, made Egypt the first civilization to do so. Egyptians, even as late as Greek times, were still possessors of canted knowledge in both music practice and theory. Thus, much that we credit to Pythagoras and the Greek music theorists have deeper roots in Alexandria and the Nile Valley. In addition, the legacy of ancient Egypt is found in the shapes, tunings, and playing styles of such folk instruments as the argol, double clarinets, the genebri of North Africa, the many end-blown flutes of the Near East, the helam of the Wolof, and the sistrum of the Ethiopian Copts. Ali devotes a long section to acquaint his readers with the spread of the Arab language east, north, and west across Africa. What he is trying to say, and the Encyclopedia Britannica adopts the same attitude toward this problem, is that since any Arabic-speaking African would be referred to as an Arab, one can be misled into making clear-cut distinctions between the Afro-Semitic or Euro-Asiatic, Arabian, and the Arabic-speaking African since there are so many instances where such distinctions would either be blurred or misleading. He thereby avoids the racial problem to some extent by seeing the Arab Moreso as a linguistic and cultural grouping rather than someone with a clear-cut racial identity. This approach has the value of freeing him to discuss the innovation and impact of the alien invaders on Andalusian music without having to distinguish the fair-skinned Arabian, save from the dark-skinned Berber of the medieval period. It is an approach, however, that has its dangers since the stage may be spotlighted with singers and players who are sometimes marginal in an examination of the African contribution to the music of the world. Music performed by the Berbers of Morocco, he demonstrates, is traditionally African. The Black Nawa, a community or tribe of griots or storytellers, perform a large part of the traditional music. They are also found in Tunisia and among the Wolof of Gambia. Ali points to a mixture of styles as among the Wolof and emphasizes that this synthesis reflecting both a Muslim and a pre-Islamic African element may be found throughout the fringes of the Sahara. He cites the work of an important African musicologist, Kebede, who asserts that an indigenous and truly African style of music cuts across Africa, north to south and east to west. Kebede says that Egyptian civilization is the cradle of music and that even the Greeks refer to Egypt as the source of their musical pedagogic ideas. Ancient Egyptian music is preserved today in the music found in the Coptic churches and it is also deeply rooted in the music characterized simply as Arabic. The controversy over the African root of the Berbers which runs through the essays of Reynolds, Chandler, and Bay, flares afresh in the citations of Ali. Graham tells us that the music of the Berbers has nothing whatsoever to do with Arab influence, but represents an ancient African style. What is remarkable and brings us back once again to brood upon the inspirations of Egypt is that the Arabs came there with their poetry, but nothing formally set to music. They did not yet have a classical form of music that they could call their own. There is no evidence of musical treatises in Arabic. Ali informs us until the 8th century. This is after their invasion and their study of Egyptian music practice and theory as translated and transmitted by the Greeks. 
Virtually all European scholars, however, claim a Persian origin of Arab music, even though they know, or at least should know, that the first Persian musical treatise dates from the 12th century, about 400 years later. The most significant of the Moorish musicians was Zuryab. He arrived in Spain in 822. He was known as Zuryab, the blackbird, a name given to him because of his black complexion, his eloquence, and the melodious sweetness of his voice. Zuryab made not just an impact on the music of Spain, especially in the development of the lute, but he became the cornerstone of Spanish musical art. In Cordova, he founded the first conservatory of music. He also invented a plectrum made of eagle quill instead of the wooden one that had been used before. He was deeply versed in every branch of art, and he was gifted with such a remarkable memory that he knew by heart upwards of 1,000 songs with their appropriate airs. Before Zuryab, the lute was composed of only four strings, which may be likened to the four elementary principles of the body. They expressed the four natural sounds. He added another red string and placed it in the middle, which considerably improved the sound and made it more harmonious. The theory of humors, which the Egyptians introduced into medicine and which had been picked up by the Greeks and through their translations by the Arabs, was now transferred to music. The object of music was to restore the equilibrium of the soul in the same way that medicine was supposed to restore the equilibrium of the body humors. Zuryab became the most fashionable arbiter of taste in the ninth century. He affected the way the upper class of Andalusia ate at the table. He was the first to introduce crystal tableware. He changed hairstyles. He introduced new customs in perfumes and deodorants, in the manner of washing clothes and cooking. He brought in new dishes, some named after him. He introduced new fashions in dress, a greater range of colors and textures of garments to suit the shift and change in seasons. He revolutionized the style of serving and eating food. Food was no longer served in one mass, as was the general case in Al-Andalus before him. Following his lead, it was broken down into separate courses, beginning with soups and ending with desserts. Apart from musical composition, instrument making achieved a high state of development in Moorish Spain. Some of the new instruments include the Cayel, the Carrizo, or reed, the lute, the rata, the rabel or rebec, the kanun, harp, the munis, the quenira, a type of zither, the quitar, the zolami, or oboe, the chakra, and the nora, or flutes. Other wind instruments mentioned are the pastoral flute, the Moorish pipes, two kinds of flagellate, and the bagpipes. The percussion instruments include the bambrel, the tambourine, castanets, brass rattles, makara, and the atambor. Even when the Moors had been defeated and Christians had reconquered the territory once occupied by these people, the music was imitated by a great number of Christian Europeans and the Christian kings still kept Moorish musicians in their employ, even as had the Moorish kings before them. Ali refers to a study of songs in the Concinero de Palacio, which contains the instrumental and vocal compositions of the Moors, who were the professional musicians at Alfonso X's court. Of the hundreds of songs examined in this work and the Cantigas of Santa Maria, the vast majority fit the pattern of the Andalusian metric system and are in the Zahal form the Moors created in the Andalusia toward the end of the ninth and the beginning of the 10th century. Their influence on musical instruments in Europe was considerable. They were the first to introduce a scientific description of musical instruments and possessed the only didactic instrumental methods in music during the Middle Ages. While most commentators agree with this, they insist that their influence was confined to that category and that they contributed nothing to musical theory. The historian of music, George Henry Farmer, points out, however, that since there was such an advanced state of instrumental music, it would be difficult to deny that some practical theory 
would have also been passed along. Indeed, says Farmer, I believe with others that the major mood due directly to the accordatura and fretting of the Arabian lute was among the new musical ideas introduced in this way. He also cites evidence for the transmission by the Moors of practical theory. Mamadou Chinyilu deals with the pivotal role of Africans in the birth of the Islamic faith and shows that they figure not only in the Prophet Muhammad's lineage but in his upbringing and development. St. Clair Drake points out and with supportive evidence that Muhammad himself was described as being of a red color. However, the ten sons of Abd al-Mutalib, Muhammad's grandfather, were all, according to D.S. Margoliuth, men of massive build and of dark color. This would not make Arabs see Muhammad as a black man in the popular American sense. We must remember that we are dealing here with polygamous families and the sons of al-Mutalib were probably not only of different wives of different races but the particular son who fathered Muhammad may also have married women of different races. This therefore would not automatically make Muhammad black or Africoid. Phenotypically at least he does not appear in that light to the Arabs. The way color prejudice had to be dealt with again and again with stern sermons by the Prophet makes it clear that the majority of his followers could not have seen him as such. A stigmata was still attached to people with classically Negroid features, St. Clair Drake tells us. His work is particularly informative on this delicate point. Black Africans, however, figure very prominently in Muhammad's life. Apart from the reputed African ancestry of his grandfather, Chin Yilu points out that he was reared by an African woman, Barakat, when his mother died. He pleaded with his family to raise money to free the African slave Bilal, who not only became a pillar of the faith, but his closest and most honored friend until his death. One of his wives, May, was an African. His adopted son, Zaid ben Harith, destined to become a great general, was also an African. Muhammad held Africa in such mystical reverence that when his early followers were fleeing persecution in Arabia, he advised them to seek asylum in Africa, for yonder lieth a land of righteousness. Africans were pivotal also in the spread of Islam. The invasion of Spain in the 8th century and the survival of the Muslim dynasties in the 11th owe a great deal to African military prowess and leadership. Chinyilu celebrates the military exploits of Tariq, who conquered Spain in 1711 AD, of Yusuf ibn Tashafin, leader of the Almoravides, who routed Alfonso VI's army in 1086, 15,000 Africans facing 70,000 Europeans, assuming leadership of Muslim Spain in 1091, and of Yaqub al-Mansur, who conquered Spain and Portugal on two separate occasions to become the most powerful ruler in the world. Such was the respect these leaders inspired in the hearts of their enemies that royal crests and coats of arms in Europe were emblazoned with Moorish heads. To the influence of Moorish science on Europe we finally turn, for it is in this field that the impact of the Moors is least known and most felt. Wayne Chandler points to advances in mathematics, the solving of quadratic equations, and the development of new concepts of trigonometry. He informs us that Moorish chemistry refined upon gunpowder invention in China and thus introduced the first shooting mechanisms known as fire sticks. They were also known for their skill in medicine. For seven centuries, the medical schools in Europe owed everything they knew to Moorish research. Vivisection, as well as dissection of dead bodies, was practiced in their anatomical schools, and women, as well as men, were trained to perform delicate surgical operations. They were the first to trace the curvilinear path of rays of light through air. This discovery in about 1100 AD is a prerequisite to the design of corrective eyeglasses. Students and teachers should read this essay also for its outline of main events in the dynasties, which no other writer in this volume attempts except John Jackson. 
Jackson's single-stranded definition of the moor, however, does not begin to address the complexities of the problem. Beatrice Lumpkin and Siham Zittler focus upon the work of mathematics in Africa during the Muslim Empire. Most of this work was done at the Dar el Hikmah, the House of Wisdom, founded in Cairo in 1005 AD. These scientists, through the use of Arabic as the common language of learning, were able to communicate with their colleagues over vast stretches of territory under Muslim influence, from Spain and Italy on the west across Africa and Asia to China on the east. They promoted the rapid progress of technology in this period. Even before the House of Wisdom was established, we have evidence of complex machines developed outside of Europe, self-operating valves, timing mechanism and delays, worm and pinion gears operated hydraulically, even crankshafts. The first steam engine had already appeared in Africa, built by Heron in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. Also the water clock and the thermometer. Europe lagged behind in the technological race and later profited immensely from these innovations. Edward Scobie deals with these aspects of Moorish science that made the global expansion of Portugal possible. Why did the British, French, Dutch, and Italians who owned the ships not undertake this journey? Since their leaders also possessed the necessary vision for such an enterprise, why didn't they take the lead? The Portuguese jumped ahead because they drew upon everything they could from the Moors. The geographical couloir for the Muslims traveled the length and breadth of the then known world and wrote the most meticulous travel accounts, Ibn Battuta and Ibn Hawkel, for example. All the advances in navigation, Latin cells, astrolabes, and nautical compasses, astronomical tables, tubes, to the extremities of which ocular and object diopters were attached, the measurement of time by pendulum oscillations, the finest maps, also gunpowder and artillery. The Moors had not only made the fire stick, as mentioned above, but even cannon forged from wrought iron. Prince Henry the Navigator, born 1394, gets all the credit for the impetus toward Portugal's expansion, as if this was a result of his creative genius. The depletion of precious metals in Europe due to the demands of foreign trade, the costly wars that were taking place, leading to even further shortages, pushed Europe to turn to Africa as an untapped source. But it was Prince Henry who channeled both this need and the science of the Moors to spearhead European expansion. As Professor Hamilton puts it, it was both the lore and the lure of Africa. Why did the perception of the Moor change? Why was there no doubt before 1492 that one was dealing with a mix of racial types speaking Arabic among whom the black African was at times a dominant figure, whereas in 1992 it would seem like racial chauvinism to suggest that Africans played a major role in the occupation and enlightenment of a critical part of Europe. The crash of Moorish power in the middle of the 13th century, although this lingered on in enclaves like Grenada until 1492, was to make a tremendous difference. It is not an accident that the year Columbus sailed was the same year the African generals in Grenada surrendered to Ferdinand and Isabella. Not only did the economic and political fortune of Africa fall dramatically after that, but so did the very image and perception in which its people were held. It was only a matter of time before it would be seen in all lands and in all phases of history as unrelated to significant cultural and scientific development. Wherever it could be shown that the African had made early and significant advances or had influenced other civilizations, be it in North Africa, Southern Europe, or Egypt, it would be seen as a direct result of some Caucasoid minority in their midst or the infusion of European blood. This led European historians to assume that there had to be a Caucasoid origin of or a Caucasoid class or caste above such extraordinary people as the Moors. Egypt, the depository of traditions of incalculable antiquity, had submitted, after a brief and determined struggle, to the common fate of nations, and the banners of Islam floated in triumph from the towers of Alexandria and Memphis. 
it was with a feeling of awe and wonder that the fierce, untutored Arab gazed upon the monuments of this strange and to him enchanted land. Before him were the pyramids, rising in massive grandeur upon the girders of the desert, the stupendous temples, the mural paintings, whose brilliant coloring was unimpaired after the lapse of fifty centuries, the group of ponderous sphinxes imposing even in their mutilation, the speaking statues which facing the east with the first ray of light saluted the coming day, the obelisk sculptured upon shaft and pedestal with the eternal records of long extinguished dynasties, the vast subterranean tombs whose every sarcophagus was a gigantic monolith and the effigies of the old Egyptian kings, personifications of dignity and power, holding in their hands the symbols of time and eternity. The influence produced by the sight of these marvels on the destiny of the simple Arab, whose horizon had hitherto been defined by the shifting sands and quivering vapors of the desert, by whom the grandeur and symmetry of architectural design was undreamt of, was incalculable. History of the Moorish Empire in Europe S. P. Scott, 1904 Professor Scott may have exaggerated the simplicity of the desert tribes who overwhelmed Egypt in the 7th century A.D., but with respect to the impact of Egyptian science on the latter Muslim invaders, the vaulted tone of the above passage carries not the slightest hint of exaggeration. The irony is that the Muslim invaders came upon inscriptions and papyri that they could not read. They were therefore to draw upon the vast body of ancient science secondhand through the translations of the Greeks, the students rather than the teachers. Thus even they, in spite of their later refinements and advances, subscribed to the notion that they had merely built upon an original European base, and that their real contribution to the scientific renaissance in Europe was largely to preserve and transmit the lost secrets of a Hellenistic heritage. This notion pervades even the latest works done on science of the Muslim peoples. Rome Landau, in his recent book, The Arab Heritage of Western Civilization, repeats this like a compulsive chant in every chapter. While Europe lost the Greek legacy, he claims, the Arabs discovered it. Again, the Arab assimilation of the Greek treasure forms one of the most fascinating chapters in the history of man's quest for knowledge. Two pages later, he is still chanting the same tune. They gradually erected on Greek foundations an intellectual edifice of their own. No field of Greek learning, from philosophy to math, medicine and botany, was neglected. Since most modern Egyptians represent a dramatic departure, both racially and culturally from the Egyptians of the dynastic era and have been taught by both British and French imperial powers to follow the Eurocentric approach in these matters, we will find this dismissive attitude towards the science of ancient Egypt even in the most devout, the most learned of Muslim scholars. Such is the case of Saeed Hassin Nasser, author of the most recent encyclopedic work on the science of the Muslims. It exudes with a spirit of superiority over the so-called materialistic vision of the European, but in a typically schizophrenic vein, it rarely ever mentions pre-Islamic Egypt as having a scientific tradition. It is the same Eurocentric chant in spite of his chauvinism. Praise be to Allah for Aristotle and Plato, Pythagoras, Euclid, Hippocrates, and Galen. We have gone beyond this, sure, but before these Greek spirits there is nothing but the womb of space. That is why I have found it necessary to outline important aspects of Egyptian science as it bears not only upon the Greek but upon the latter invaders of Egypt. See my chapter, The Egyptian Precursor to Greek and Arab Science, which illustrates in a courtroom judgment the case against the main Greek plagiarist Archimedes and Pythagoras. A later version will provide supplements to this indictment. It is important that readers be made aware of this African background since it is difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish at all times 
African Muslims from other Muslim scientists. What we can say about Moorish science is that it was not European in its seminal inspiration and only minimally affected by Europeans before 1492. It was a multicultural tradition involving strong African and Arabian elements but also elements of the Hindu, the number system for example, and the Chinese, gunpowder technology. Science ideally is beyond racial classification. It is neither black nor white, African nor European. What one man invents becomes the common property and benefit of the whole human race. But when there is a perceived attempt, conscious and unconscious, preserved and relentlessly over the centuries to minimize or exclude the contribution of people of a certain race, then an emphasis upon those invisible people in history becomes a duty, a mission, a necessary corrective. It is not that we seek to denigrate the achievements of the Greek, nor to subtract one iota from the contribution so loosely labeled as Arab, but to point out that there are seminal antecedents to the Greek that are too critical and significant to be ignored, and that both ancient and contemporary African element mixes and melts in the crucible that became the science of the Moors. Appendix to Editorial Rebuttal to letter of Dana Reynolds on the Tamahu by Wayne B. Chandler. In reviewing the summary of Dana Reynolds' section on what constitutes a Berber, several factors come to mind. First, in addressing her statements pertaining to Berbers, I find it necessary to explain what seems to me to be the obvious. There is no question that there are groups of black Berbers in the northern countries of Africa, but my task was to identify and trace the origin of a particular group or segment of this Berber population which came to be known as the Tawny Moor. That these so-called white Moors existed is irrefutable, for there are not only litanies of written documentation but scores of painted renditions of these Berbers to remind us of their presence in the Islamic conquest and construction of North Africa and Spain. Thus, it is not by my design that we are able to trace these groups through the chronicles of the Arabs, Romans, Garamantes, Carthaginians, and Egyptians. For Reynolds to refute such obvious data is uncharacteristic of her high degree of scholarship. Using anthropology, etymology, and quoted comments from the Egyptians themselves, we have no trouble in tracing the Tawny Moor or White Berber to the group known as the Libyan and from the Libyan to Tamahu. Beside the historical accounts of these whites, which is demonstrated on the famed palette of Narmer Menes, if we are taking into consideration visual evidence, and the statuary of Rehotep and consort Nofret, we have the written testimony of these white Libyans on the Wadi Maghara, which contains several memorials to the ancient kings of Egypt. The Wadi Maghara states that in the 6th dynasty, Pepi I was the conqueror of the Tamahu, the foreign people who in his time dwelt in the valley of caverns. This is testimony from the horse's mouth. Who are we to refute it? A pictorial representation of four races of men is found on the tomb of Seti I. Of these four races, each a different color, we find men arranged in groups of four each. One of these is the European and is depicted as white as snow with the designated inscription Tamahu. Reynolds quotes Behrens and Arkell stating that in the Tamahu they identify a sea group culture which was quote, tall, slender, and obviously black. What makes this so obvious? And who is stating this? Behrens and Arkell? Reynolds? Or a third party whom Reynolds is quoting? Her statement suggests she is quoting someone else who is quoting these sources and that they have not been thorough in their research. Etymology in this case is unwavering and inflexible and states most assuredly that the Egyptian word Tamahu means the white people. In regards to Reynolds' comments on the Tihanu, it has been acknowledged by Egyptologists and historians alike 
who have correctly translated the hieroglyphs, that this group was of the black race. Job, writing in 1955, states, The Tihenu, or Black Lebu, was probably the ancestor of the modern Lebo. These blacks preceded the Tamahu, or white Libyans, in that region of the western delta. The existence of the first black inhabitant, the Tehenu, made it possible to create confusion over the term brown Libyan. As historians, it is our responsibility to convey an accurate account of what has transpired in our past. We must at all costs refrain from the same tactics employed against us by the European historian, for as we have seen, this approach leaves a void which is easily filled with the truth, making it easy to refute all lies and scholarship which is based on deception. That among the predominant black types, there was also an Euro-Asiatic species of man in Egypt from a very early historical period is fact. That they in latter times came to be known as Libyans is also fact. That these Libyans amalgated with the indigenous blacks of the area which eventually produced what came to be called the Tawny or White Moor is also irrefutable. Reynolds cannot afford to misrepresent the historical ledger because she wants to paint the entire population of Africa as black when there is substantial evidence to the contrary. I have no doubt that in most cases Dana Reynolds' approach to history is impeccable, but in this matter I find an oversight in her categorizing of the Tamahu and their relationship to the Berbers. I do agree, however, with her assessment of the black Libyans and the historical role they have played during and after the Arab conquest. End of part one. The Moor in Africa and Europe. The Moors in Antiquity by James E. Brunson and Runoko Rashidi. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the Moors as early as the Middle Ages and as late as the 17th century were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy, and hence the word is often used for a Negro. There is considerable difficulty, however, in determining the ethnicity of the early Moors through terminology alone. Indeed, there are several terms that have been used to identify the Moors. Arabic texts, for example, rarely use the word Moor, and instead apply the term Berber, a word thought by some to be pejorative to the early non-Arab peoples of Northwest Africa. And when not employing that term, they utilized the clan names of the Berbers themselves. In addition, early Christian sources often apply the term Saracen indiscriminately to Muslim populations in general, including the Moors. The term Moor. Although scholars generally agree that the word Moor is derived from Mari, there are profound disagreements on what the word originally meant and how it was applied. Philip K. Hetty contends that the term Moor has a geographic designation meaning Western. Hetty, the author of the Comprehensive History of the Arabs, writes that The Romans called Western Africa Mauritania and its inhabitants Mori, presumably of Phoenician origin meaning Western, whence the Spanish Moro and the English Moor. The Berbers, therefore, were the Moors proper, but the term was conventionally applied to all Muslims of Spain and northwestern Africa. Using Greek and Roman sources, Frank M. Snowden has pointed out that the Mori, a northwest African people whose color received frequent notice, were described as Negri, black, and a dusty, scorched. The Roman dramatist, Platus, 254 to 184 BC maintained that the Latin word Morris was a synonym for Niger. In contrasting the Moors of the 6th century with another racial group in North Africa, Procopius, circa 550, wrote that they were, quote, not black skinned like the Moors. Isidore, a Catholic scholar and the Archbishop of Seville, 587 to 636, wrote, that the word Morris meant black. With the sudden eruption of the Arabs during the middle of the 7th century, Mori disappears for a time from historical records. It reemerges, however, in medieval literature. For example, in a Middle English romance called 
King Alessander, circa 1175, the conqueror Darius has among his troops a contingent of soldiers led by Duke Morin. Regarding Morin, J.B. Friedman writes that, it sounds rather like more in this context. As late as 1398, we find the following reference to the Moors. Also the nation of Moors, their black color cometh of the inner parties. There are Irish records of a Viking raid on Spain and North Africa in 862. During the raid, a number of blacks were captured and some carried to Dublin. In Ireland, they were known as Blue Men, Irish for Gorma, Old Norse, Blamen. The entry is under the title, Three Fragments Copied from Ancient Sources, and sheds further lights on the ethnicity of the Moors. The entry reads, After that, the Scandinavians went through the country and ravaged it, and they burned the whole land and they brought a great host of the Moors in captivity with them to Ireland. These are the blue men for Garma, because the Moors are the same as Negroes. Mauritania is the same as Negro land. A vital source of information regarding medieval Spain is the Cantigas of Santa Maria, sponsored and allegedly written by Alfonso X, 1254-1286, the Cantigas represent a survey of secular medieval attitudes and actions. At least 28 of the long poems deal primarily with Moors. One mentions Yusuf ibn Takfin and the Almoravid conquest. This may indicate that the clearly distinct blacks identified as Moors in most of the Cantigas are most intimately connected with the Almoravid invasions of Spain during the 11th century. Medieval illuminators portrayed blacks in the Cantigas in a variety of roles, from members of the aristocracy to the military. Included among the aristocratic images of Islamic Spain is a black man receiving gifts from a caliph or emir. In another, two noble Moors are shown playing chess while being attended by black and white servants and musicians. In the Almoravid army, Moors are shown as foot soldiers, bowmen, lancers on horseback, as well as high-ranking officers. They are also shown as menials, musicians, and Christian converts. During the Middle Ages, because of his dark complexion and Islamic faith, the Moor became in Europe a symbol of guile, evil, and hate. In medieval literature, demonic figures were commonly depicted with black faces. Among Satan's titles in medieval folklore were Black Knight, Black Man, Black Ethiopian, and Black Negro. In the Cantiga, 185, of King Alfonso, the Wise of Spain, 1254 to 1286, three Moors attacking the castle of Chincoya are described as black as Satan. In Cantiga 329, an extremely black man who has stolen objects from a Christian church is identified as a Moor. In the Poema de Fernan Gonzalez, Devils and Moors are equally described as carbonientos, literally the coal-faced ones. French historian Jean de Vies writes that the Castilians were at first acutely aware of the power of black fighting men and in time transferred the old feeling of hostility from the Ethiops to the black Moor. As is well known, not all of the battles during these years of Islamic domination resulted in Moorish victories. For example, during a fierce engagement in 1096 between the Moors and Spanish Christians, four Moorish princes were killed. Around 1281, Peter III of Aragon commemorated this Christian victory with the immemorial bearings of a cross cantoned between four woolly-haired Moors. This coat of arms was updated by the Habsburg King Charles on a gold coin shortly after 1700. Moors with broad noses, thick lips, and woolly heads upon which rest crowns dominate the coin. During the European Renaissance, explorers, writers, and scholars began to apply the term Moor to blacks in general. A prominent example of this tendency can be found in the work of Richard Hakluyt 
a 15th century traveler. Haklut recorded that in old times the people of Africa were called Ethiops and Negrete, which we now call Moors, Morins, or Negroes. Shakespearean scholar Elmer E. Stoll provides additional insight regarding the use of the word Moor as it relates to the late medieval and early Renaissance Europe. A striking proof that the word Moor was, as among the Germans at this time, exactly equivalent to Negro is not only its use as applied to the curly-haired, thick-lipped Aaron in Titus Andronicus, but also the constant interchange of the two words as applied to the equally unmistakable Negro Eleazar in Lust's Dominion. In the Romance languages, Spanish, French, and Italian, of medieval Europe, Moor was translated as Moro, Moa, and Moor. Derivatives of the word Moor may be found even today in these same languages. In Spanish, for example, the word for blackberry is Mora, a noun which originally meant Moorish woman. Also in Spanish, the adjective for dark complexion, which now means brunette, is moreno. We find a similar legacy in the French language. In French, moricard means dark-skinned or blackamoor, while morion means black grape. Again, as in the Spanish, the Italian word mora means negro or Moorish female. Also in Italian, mora means blackberry, while mariola means black olive. The term Berber. Strictly speaking, writes Thomas F. Glick, Moors were Mori, Berbers who lived in the Roman province of Mauritania. Therefore, its use stresses, sometimes by design, the Berber contributions to the Al-Andalusian culture. In Arabic literature, the word Moor was fairly non-existent, and the term Berber was applied to practically all the inhabitants of the Maghrib, Islamic North Africa, west of Egypt. The term Berber is thought to have derived from the Latin Barbari, an appellation equivalent to the English Barbarian, which the Romans called peoples who neither spoke Latin or Greek. The view that the ancient Berbers were a predominantly white-skinned, blue-eyed race of Hamites has been largely shaped by recent colonial attitudes toward Africa. Another idea that seems to be gaining general acceptance is that the bulk of the population consisted of a mixture. Our view is that the Berbers emerged as the result of an intermixture between Caucasoid people, who had moved into the Maghrib by the second millennium B.C., and the more ancient Africoid inhabitants of North Africa. Among the Berbers of North Africa, according to Roman documents, were the Black Gatuli, Milano Gatuli, and black-skinned Asfo Delodes. In addition, Harold A. McMichael points out that the Africoid blacks, the Tibu and Tuareg, resembling the ancient Nigritians of the Sahara, are by origin Lambda Berbers. The Haritan, an ancient people whose descendants now occupy southern Morocco and Mauritania, have been called Black Berbers. Arab geographer Ibn Hakal, circa 950, considered the Tuareg to have come originally from the Sudan and that by their mothers they are the children of Ham. Wa Ibn Munabi, who died in 732, wrote that the Berbers belong to the black races of Ham. Uthman Amir Abin Bar al Jaziz, 776-869, a brilliant black Muslim writer, in a significant work entitled The Superiority of the Blacks Over the Whites, stated that among the blacks are counted the Sudanese, the Ethiopians, the Fezan, the Berbers, the Copts, the Nubians, the Zaghawa, the Moors. Included among the pastoral Berber clans were the Luwada, Zanata, Nafusa, Zuwaga, Mignasa, and Nafzawa. Among the more sedentary Berber clans were the Sanhaja, Masmuda, Kutama, Gamara, and Hawara. 
of the clans that were instrumental in the Muslim invasions and occupation of Spain were the Navza, Masmuda, Luwata, Hawara, Sanata, Sanhaja, and Zugwaha. A Muslim scholar, while discussing the Berber women of the Sanhaja Confederation, wrote that their color is black, though some pale ones can be found among them. In the Romance of the Cid, Rodrigo Diaz de Bivar, with its graphic references to the Almoravids, we are further informed of the ethnicity of at least some Berber women. This group of women consisted of 300 Almoravid Amazons led by a black Moorish woman named Nugameth Turkia. She appears in the Primera Chronica General of Alfonso X. El Sabio, King of Castile and Leon, 1252 to 1284. The Primera was completed about 1289 under his successor, Sancho IV. The events are associated with the Almoravid siege of Valencia after the death of Cid. Nugamath Turquia is the leader of the band of 300 Amazons. They are negresses. They have their heads shaven, leaving only a top knot. They are on a pilgrimage and they are armed with Turkish bows. According to the text, King Bukhar ordered that black Moorish women to encamp nearest to the town with all her company. That Moorish woman was so shrewd a master archer with the Turkish bow that it was a wonder to behold. And for that reason, the history says that the Moors called her in Arabic Nugamath Turkia which means Star of the Archers of Turkey. Far from being primitive savages, the accumulated evidence points to industry, commerce, and technical proficiency among the ancient Berbers. Among the products introduced by them into Spain were olives, wheat, figs, ambergris, and saffron. Dyes and garments from North Africa were also highly prized. These North Africans engaged in the mining of silver and iron and traded in gold and coral with the Sudan. The term Saracen While many scholars generally agree that the word Saracen is of Afro-Asiatic origin, it is far from certain that it means Eastern. The general belief is that the Saracens were originally nomadic tribes of the Arabian and Syrian deserts early known as peoples who attacked the borders of the Roman Empire. Pliny the Elder, or Pliny the Naturalist, 23-79 to 79 AD, appears to have been the earliest author to mention the Saracens as a group of people. St. Jerome, circa 375, in his Commentario Room in Assam, identified a people in Western Asia known as the Agarini. Hagarins, descendants of Hagar the Egyptian, who are now called Saracens, taking themselves the name Sarah. German theologian Rabanus Morris, 776 to 856, made similar observations in his Commentaria in Genesium. Morris connected the Moors typologically with the house of Ishmael. It is significant to note that an early medieval kingdom located in the Mesopotamian Delta was called Karasin. It was known to the Byzantine Greeks as Saracenos. According to French historian Jean-Paul Kleber, Kara, which means black, linguistically evolved into Saracenos, Saracen. The medieval Spanish painter, says French art historian Jean de Vise, associated the color black with the Saracens. Dorothy Mitalitsky, however, stresses that the people who contributed to the formation of what in the Middle Ages was known as Saracen culture were of the most varied ethnic origins. Saracens served a crucial public role, states Mitalitsky, political, military, and religious and what is fanciful in them is emphasized for the purposes of patriotism, propaganda, and entertainment. It is in this context 
that the prominent position of confrontation between Christian knights and mighty, even gigantic black Saracen warriors emerges. The Song of Roland The Song of Roland, circa 1100, the celebrated medieval epic poem chronicles the 8th century Frankish invasion of northern Spain and describes the Saracens in detail. Sir Roland, the epic's hero, was allegedly the prefect of Brittany and a champion and gallant warrior in the army of the Carolinian Emperor Charlemagne. Roland is said to have perished while defending the rear guard of the Frankish army during the Battle of Roncesvalles on August 15th, 778. As noted by H. T. Norris, the Song of Roland is particularly harsh in its abuse and racial hatred. The epic is alternately laced with contrasting images of the Saracens as vile and repulsive, dashing, lady-killing, beautifully arrayed in battle, and envied for their magnificent Arabian steeds. Fortunately, from Roland's epic encounter with the Saracens, we have an important window from which we can view both the pronounced Africoid element in the Saracen ranks and Christian Europe's sharp reaction to it. Citing the Saracen army, Sir Roland declares that at their head rides the Saracen Abysme. No worse criminal rides in that company, stained with the marks of his crimes and great treasons, lacking the faith in God, St. Mary's son, and he is black as black as melted pitch. In addition, the epic speaks of Ethiop, a cursed land indeed. The blackamoors from there are in his keep. Broad in the nose they are, and flat in ear. Fifty thousand and more in company. And then, to further highlight the racial identity of the army facing Roland, when Roland sees that unbelieving race, those hordes and hordes blacker than the blackest ink, no shred of white on them except their teeth. In an Italian palace in Trevisio, dated to the late 14th century, there are vivid frescoes of the Song of Roland. One of these frescoes portrays the conversion and baptism of Otuel, the Saracen, who is painted with black skin. Black Saracens, Giants and Mighty Warriors Representations of black Saracen giants in medieval literature began with Vernigu, found in the Pseudo-Turpin Chronicle of Charlemagne. Dated to the early 14th century, the Ruland and Vernigu describes a duel between the blackest pitch Saracen, Vernigu, and the Christian knight, Roland. Another towering figure was Algofer, the Ethiopian giant of the Saudon of Babylon whose skin was black and hard. It is said that this Adrugat of Ethiopia, he was a king of great strength. There was none such in Europe, so strong and so long in length. I thought he were a devil son of Beelzebub's line. There is also the legendary fight between William of Orange, an 11th century Count of Poitiers, and Isor, a black Saracen giant. The portrayals of black Saracen giants in medieval literature thus reflects the realistic associations of tall Africans in Saracen armies. Blacks likewise appear as sea-roving Saracens in the early Viking sagas. For example, in the Orkneyinga saga, a 13th century Icelandic account of the Earls of Orkney, References are made to a great battle on the Mediterranean Sea between Vikings and Black Saracens. It is stated that once both parties were aboard, there were fierce fighting. The people on the Dromund being Saracens, whom we call infidels of Muhammad, among them a good many black men who put up a strong resistance. The fighting qualities of the Black Saracens must have been quite striking to the Earl of Orkney who wrote, Erling, honored aimer of spears, eagerly advanced toward the vessel in victory. With hammers of blood, the black warriors, brave lads, we captured or killed, crimsoning our blades. Busy with this Dromon business, our blades we bloodied on the blacks. 
After sparing some of the captives, including their leader, these Vikings fell into the hands of more Saracens, who repaid them with similar generosity. Moorish Militarism The discussion of Moorish militarism begins distinctly with the ancient martial conflicts between Rome and Carthage. Moorish soldiers are mentioned as early as the expedition to Sicily in 406 BC in the revolt by certain Hanno, circa 350 BC, and the Roman invasion of Africa in 256 BC. They are similarly mentioned in Livy's account of the Second Punic War, 218 to 201 BC. In the bitter, prolonged, and increasingly desperate struggle for national independence and control of the Western Mediterranean, the Carthaginians utilized Moorish troops as integral elements in all of their battle campaigns. With the Numidians, the Moors fought on the side of the Carthaginians against the Romans. These redoubtable Moorish warriors greatly aided the Carthaginians and were particularly beneficial to Hannibal Barca, the illustrious African general. Indeed, Hannibal, who had over 6,000 Moors at his disposal, suffered his only defeat when they were no longer available. Nevertheless, the destruction of Carthage in the Third Punic War, 150 to 146 BC, Rome became the supreme power in North Africa. In spite of Roman dominance, however, regional and national independence movements continued unceasingly. Unfortunately, because of the many North African revolts against Roman authority, historians tend to mention only those that were of exceptional violence and intensity. One such rising, known as the Ugarthene War, 112 to 105 BC, was initiated by the nationalist fervor of the North African patriot Ugurtha. Directing an unrelenting guerrilla war, Ugurtha became a formidable adversary to his enemies, inflicting embarrassing defeats upon the Roman legions. The wars of Ugurtha, writes Graham Webster, demonstrated the value of the nimble Moorish horsemen who Trajan later found so useful against the Dacians. During the Dacian wars of Eastern Europe, 101 to 105, the Roman military relied heavily upon highly mobile units of Moorish cavalry. On a Roman column dedicated to the wars of Trajan in Dacia, there is a special relief devoted to a large body of galloping horsemen easily recognizable as Moors. They are depicted with tiered and plated rolls of curled hair, short tunics, saddleless with only a single bridle. Another work dated to the same period is a terracotta human head found in the Dacian city of Sudavia described by archaeologists as the head of a negro or moor, it is in many respects similar to the horse cavalry depicted on the Roman column. Black soldiers, specifically identified as moors, were actively recruited by Rome and served tours of duty in Britain, France, Switzerland, Austria, Hungary, Poland, Romania, etc. An original brass military diploma, which dates from the middle of the 2nd century AD, mentions Moorish soldiers in Moesia, which is modern Serbia. Another military diploma of AD 158 speaks of Moorish soldiers from Africa and Dacia, or modern Romania, and also of auxiliary troops of the Dacian Moors. A Roman document, Notitia Dignatium, which dates from the beginning of the 5th century AD, mentions several Moorish battalions in the Balkans and the Moorish military colony Ad Moros, which was located on the Inn River near Vienna, in what is modern Bessarabia. There was a city called Moro Castrum. According to the document Notita Dignitatium, 2,500 to 5,000 Illyrian Moorish soldiers in five separate military units had served in the Near East. From this document, we must deduce that at the beginning of the 5th century, at least 100,000 descendants of Moors lived in Illyricum, which was located in the present-day Balkans. Regarding specific military men of Moorish extraction, there were several that served Rome honorably or had ancestors that participated in Rome's foreign wars. In 253, for example, after his departure, the governor of Lower Moesia, modern Serbia, M. Amelius Amelanius, 
a Moor born in Mauritania, succeeded in defeating the Goths and was proclaimed emperor by his troops. In another case, Xenophilus, consul of Numidia, boasts that my grandfather is a soldier. He had served in the Comitatus, for our family is of Moorish origin. To the Comitatus belonged the renowned Equites Mori, a black horse cavalry of North Africa. The Moors before the invasion of Spain. We should not lose sight of the fact that connections between North Africa and Spain were in existence centuries before the birth of Muhammad. It would not even be presumptuous to suggest that very early blood ties may have connected the regions. The fact that blacks had lived in some of the same Iberian regions later occupied by Islamic Moors suggests this. For example, the city of Osuna in southern Spain has yielded several archaeological works depicting blacks with tightly curled hair which archaeologists have labeled Negroid. As long ago as 170, writes Durant, the Mori or Moors invaded Spain from Africa. Even earlier, according to Leroy, the Berbers of that region made incursions into Baetica, Spain. But the use of the term Berber perhaps camouflages the issue here. Regarding the same event, W. T. Arnold speaks of Moorish incursions in Baetica as early as the first century. Interestingly enough, many of these Moors were Christians. During the 6th century, the Byzantine historian Procopius and the Latin poet Corippus compiled precious documents regarding the Moors in post-Roman North Africa. During this period, the dominance of the Vandals, the Germanic tribes who had invaded North Africa in 429 and seized several provinces, including Mauritania, was challenged politically and militarily. In providing a veritable war correspondence view, Procopius chronicled the ferocious assaults and ultimate victories of the Moorish rebels. This is recorded in his volume, appropriately entitled, The Wars. When the Moors wrestled Oracium from the Vandals, not a single enemy had until now ever come there or so much as caused the barbarians to be afraid that they would come and the Moors of that place also held the land west of Aurasium, a tract both extensive and fertile, and beyond these dwelt other nations of the Moors who were ruled by the Orteas. This statement shows that the Moors were not only perceived by Procopius as numerically significant, but demonstrates that they occupy an extensive portion of northwest Africa. During this same period, Byzantine arms began moving into Africa. With them came strong efforts to renew the grip of Roman dominance. The Emperor Justinian sent in General Johannes Troglita to quell the challenge to Byzantine authority, but was forced to face a full-scale war. There was a great slaughter and taking of prisoners as recounted by Corippus in the military epic Ionis. Corippus not only recorded the slaying of several Moorish chieftains, he also mentioned a number of captives that were as black as crows. One Moorish ruler, however, Garmul, king of Mauritania, engineered the crushing of the Byzantine army in 571. Such events established the situation in North Africa prior to the Arabs' invasion later in the 7th century. The Moorish Conquest of Spain Early in the 8th century, after a grim and extended resistance to the Arab invasions of North Africa, the Moors joined the triumphant surge of Islam. Following this, they crossed over to the Iberian Peninsula where their swift victories and remarkable feats soon became the substance of legends. The man chosen to lead the probe into Iberia was Tarif, son of Zara ibn Abi Modric. Tarif was one of the young generation of Islamized Berbers imbued with the military thinking of Hassan ibn al-Numan and Musa ibn Nusayr, the two men who had just commanded the Arab conquest of northwest Africa. In July 710, Tarif, with 400 foot soldiers and 100 horse, 
all Berbers successfully carried out a reconnaissance mission in southern Iberia. Tarifa, a small port in southern Spain, is named after him. It is clear, however, that the conquest of Spain was undertaken upon the initiative of Tariq ibn Zaid. Tariq ibn Zaid ibn Abd Allah ibn Walgu was a member of the War Farjuma branch of the Nafsa Berbers. Musa ibn Nusayr had previously appointed him governor of the far western Maghrib, which covered what is today the southern part of the Kingdom of Morocco. Tariq was in command of an army of at least 10,000 men, mainly Sanhadra Berbers. In 711, with a Berber expeditionary force and a small number of Arab translators and propagandists, some say 300, Tariq crossed the straits and disembarked near a rocky promontory which from that day since has borne his name, Jabal Tariq, Tariq's Mountain, or Gibraltar. In August 711, he won a decisive victory over the Visigoth army. It was during this conflict that Roderick, the last Visigoth king, was killed. On the eve of the battle, Tariq is alleged to have roused his troops with the following words, My brethren, the enemy is before you, the sea is behind. Whither would ye fly? Follow your general. I am resolved either to lose my life or to trample on the prostrate king of the Romans. Wasting no time to relish his victory, Tariq pushed on with his seemingly tireless Berber cavalry to Toledo and seized the Visigoth capital. Within a month's time, Tariq ibn Zayed had effectively terminated Visigothic dominance of the Iberian Peninsula. Musa ibn Nusayr joined Tariq in Spain and helped complete the conquest of Iberia with an army of 18,000 Arab and Berber troops. The two commanders met at Talavera. Here, Tariq and his Berbers were given the task of subduing the northwest of Spain. With vigor and speed, they set about their mission, and within three months, they had swept the entire territory north of the Ebro River as far as the Pyrenees, and annexed the turbulent Basque country. There, they left a small detachment of men under Munusa, a Berber lieutenant who was later to play a decisive role in the Muslim campaigns in southern France. In the aftermath of these brilliant struggles, Berbers by the thousands flooded into the Iberian Peninsula. So eager were they to come that some are said to have floated over on tree trunks. Tariq himself, at the conclusion of his illustrious military career, retired to the distant east, we are informed, to spread the teachings of Islam. While many modern historians refer to Tariq's garrison as Berbers and Arabs, primary sources such as Ibn Hussein, circa 950, recorded that these troops were Sudanese, an Arabic word for black people. Arab writers Ibn Hayyans and Ibn al-Athir, 1160-1234, the authors of Dakir Bilad al-Andalus, and the Akbar Majmua, respectively, both refer to Tariq's invading force. The author of Dakir Bilad al Andalus specifically refers to a force of at least 700 Sudanese in Tariq's garrison. This suggests that some modern writers have attempted to place an artificial wedge between these early Berbers and blacks. References to these blacks have so puzzled some modern scholars that there have been vain attempts to explain away and discredit their very existence. For example, Norris writes, When some of the accounts tell of Negroes and Tariq's army, that army which ascended the rock of Gibraltar with its pack beast, built a wall for defense and mastered the plain of Algecaris, then it is improbable that they were Nubians or Ethiopians. In discussing the status of these blacks, Taha suggests that they were probably slaves. An Arab legend describes these blacks as pseudo-cannibals. The Sudanese blacks took captive of the Goths. They slew them and pretended to eat them and this added to the fear and terror of them. There is really no need to speculate on the ethnicity of these early invaders of the conquest period. 
primarily Christian sources relating to the conquest, particularly the Primera Chronica General of Alfonso X, make the following observation on the Moors. Their faces were as black as pitch. The handsomest among them was as black as a cooking pot. With the conquest and settlement of Spain, the Arabs developed patterns of racial bias toward the Berbers. This bias, sometimes blatant and other times more subtle, manifested itself in various ways, including disproportionate tax assessments and poor land allotments. For example, after founding the Almohad dynasty, the Berber ruler Abd al Mumin offered the Granadan post of able secretary to an Arab poet named Abu Ghaffar. Scheduled to work with al Mumin's son, Abu Said, the Arab poet hesitated. The Arab poet hesitated because the dark skinned Berber seemed to him far below his own intellectual standards. This kind of attitude often led to hostile feelings, open rebellions, and shifting alliances between the Arab, Berber, and Christian factions of the Iberian Peninsula. In the 9th century, in order to achieve commercial dominance in the region, Muslim powers in Tunisia launched an invasion of Sicily. The conquest was facilitated by large and well-organized fleets coming from the east coast of Spain and the western Maghreb and manned chiefly by Berbers. It began in 827 and ended ten years later with the storming of Palermo. The occupation of Palermo was followed by the occupation of Messina in 842 and Syracuse in 878. In 937, Ibn Harqal noted that blacks were very common in Palermo. Regarding one of the city's main entrances, Harqal wrote that it was called the Bab es Sudan, or Gate of the Blacks, so named after its ebony hued residents. Pope Leo III referred to these blacks variously as Moors, Agarini, and Saracens. Islamic encroachment on the European mainland took place around 846 when Saracens landed at the mouth of the Tiber River and besieged Rome. Of this invasion, the German historian Hinkmar, circa 875, wrote that The Arabs and Moors assaulted Rome on the Tiber, and when they laid waste to the Basilica of the Blessed Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, and carried off all the ornaments and treasures with the very altar which was situated above the tomb of the famous Prince of Apostles, they occupied strongly a fortified hill a hundred miles from the city. In the invasion of Rome, Pope John the Seventh agreed to pay an annual tribute of 25,000 marks of silver to the Saracens to retreat. Frederick II, 1197 to 1250, of the Hohenstaufen dynasty, developed especially close relationships with the remaining blacks in Sicily and retained a Morris Chamberlain, who was constantly in his presence. While admittedly breaking the Islamic power base, he also solicited the aid of the Moors from Palermo in his intense struggle with the papacy. After resettling conquered Muslims on the Italian mainland at Lucera, the monarch recruited an elite guard unit of 16,000 black troops. One of the independent sovereigns of Moorish descent with whom Frederick II came into contact with was Moribit a name whose attachment may be found with the Sanhaja Berber tribes known as Morabit. Growing conflicts and rebellion against the expansionist policies of Frederick II eventually led to the death of Morabit. In 1239, however, another black man, Johannes Morris, attained a position of considerable authority at the Hohenstaufen royal court. In South Italy and Sicily, writes Paul Kaplan, dark-skinned Muslims had already been visible for several centuries. The Moorish Occupation of Spain Among the most substantial Berber groups to occupy Spain were the Hawara, Luwata, Navza, Masmuda, Mignasa, Zanata, and Sanhaja. Before participating in the 8th century invasion of Spain, 
the Hawara Berbers in Africa occupied the province of Tripolitania and the deserts of southern Tunisia. They worshipped the Libyan sun god Amun, who was depicted as a bull or ram. After the invasion of Spain, they settled in Cordoba and established a fortified city near Jaén. A wealthy group of Hawara also settled in Morita and Medellin. Abd al-Rahman ibn Musa al-Hawari was a judge in Esija during the reign of Abd al-Rahman III. The golden age of the Umayyad dynasty in Spain came during the 10th century. Under the reigns of Abd al-Rahman III, 912-61, and Hakam II, 961-76, the Umayyad dynasty established sovereignty over the most substantial portion of the Iberian Peninsula. At the pinnacle of the Umayyad dynasty, the great city of Cordoba possessed 200,000 residences, 600 mosques, and 900 public baths that were patronized by all social classes. Among his many accomplishments, Hakam II added 27 schools for the free instruction of the poor. It should be pointed out that, at least during this era of Islamic Spain, girls as well as boys went to school and numerous Moorish women became prominent in the literary and artistic fields. Other Moorish women were involved in education, law, medicine, and library science. Both Tariq ibn Zayyad and Abd al-Rahman I, the founder of the Umayyad dynasty in Spain in 756, are said to have belonged to the Navza Berbers. In fact, one of the most important keys to Abd al-Rahman's success as a monarch was his recruitment, directly from Africa, of a well-trained army of more than 40,000 Berbers. Many of the Nafsa settled in Spain. Rich and numerous, the Nafsa Berbers of Osuna, Spain, became civic leaders, writers, and theologians. The Nafsa also constituted a significant part of the population of Takaruna. The Masmuda Berbers were described as blacks by Abu Shama in his Kitab al Rav Datayan. They settled in several parts of Spain, including Marur, Cordoba, Valencia, Guadalajara, and Santaver. Masmuda Berbers also settled in southern Portugal. Neither did wealth and prestige escape the Masmuda. The previously mentioned founder of the powerful Almohad dynasty, Abd al Mumin, was a Masmuda Berber. Al Kahina, circa 690, the woman who led the most determined resistance to the early Arab invasion of North Africa, was a Zenata Berber. With the invasion of Spain, many Zenatas settled near Seville in Sidonia, Alicante, Murcia, Guadalajara, and in the region of Saragossa. The Marinids, who in 1275 invaded Spain from Morocco and defeated Christian Castile, were Zenata Barbers. Zenata is written several ways in various texts. The Zenata used a Libyo Berber script and spoke Zenaga, a Cushito Hamitic language. This seems to be the basis for the name Senegal. The Zenata are also credited with having introduced the camel into the Maghrib. The Sanhaja Berbers of the Western Sahara were composed of both sedentary peoples and nomads. Included among the nomad Sanhaja were the Lamta and Lamtuna Berbers. The Sanhaja, known as the Mulath Thamun, people of the Vale, were responsible for the second significant Moorish invasion of Al-Andalus, the Arabic name for Islamic Spain. In 1095, the Sanhaja Berbers initiated the Almoravid dynasty. The Almoravid dynasty was called the Empire of the Two Shores. It lasted a hundred years and stretched from the Senegal River in West Africa to the Ebro River in northern Spain. There has been much discussion and speculation about the Sanhaja face mufflers. 
In Islamic Spain, the veil was considered a privilege of the true Almoravids, and its wearing was forbidden to all but the Sanhadra. It was something like a uniform or distinctive dress of the ruling class. According to Ibn Hakal, since the day they were created, their faces have never been seen unless it be their eyes. This is because they muffle their faces when they are young and they grow up with that custom. According to Al-Bakri, there were among the Sanhadra Berbers blacks professing Judaism. These blacks are referred to as the Bafur. The Bafur practiced Judaism before they were overcome and absorbed by the Almoravids. The Bafur and Sanhadra are both linked, by the way, through their association with the early rulers of the Ghananian Empire. A prototype of the warrior king, both as priest and potentate, the Almoravid emperor Yusuf ibn Tashfin led veiled fighting men into Al-Andalus beginning in 1086 at the request of the hard-pressed Muslim residents of Spain. Yusuf, a Sanhaja Berber from the Sudan, had his physical features described by the Arab chronicler Al-Fasi as brown-skinned, small-framed and hook-nosed, with heavy eyebrows and woolly hair. Among Yusuf's troops was a personal retinue of 4,000 blacks carrying lamb tea shields, covered in hippopotamus skin, peculiar bowls, Yazani spears, Zabian javelins, and moving to the constant sound of drumming. The bizarre aspect of the African army, writes Norris, was a valuable psychological weapon. The Black Saint Maurice, Knight of the Holy Lance. The name Maurice is derived from Latin and means like a moor. The Black Saint Maurice, the Knight of the Holy Lance, is regarded as the greatest patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire. The earliest version of the Maurice story and the account upon which all later versions are based is found in the writings of Eucherius, Bishop of Lyon, circa 450. According to Eucherius, Maurice was a high official in the Thebaid region of Egypt, an early center of Christianity. Specifically, Maurice was the commander of a Roman legion of Christian soldiers stationed in Africa. By the decree of Roman Emperor Maximian, his contingent of 6,600 men was dispatched to Gaul in order to suppress a Christian uprising there. Maurice disobeyed the order. Subsequently, he and almost all of his troops were martyred when they chose to die rather than persecute Christians, renounce their faith, and sacrifice to the gods of the Romans. The execution of the Theban legion occurred in Switzerland, near Aganium, which later became St. Maurice en Valais, on September 22nd, either in the year 280 or 300. In the second half of the 4th century, the worship of St. Maurice spread over a broad area in Switzerland, northern Italy, Burgundy, and along the Rhine. Tours, Angers, Lyon, chalon sur seon and Dijon had churches dedicated to St. Maurice. By the epoch of Islamic Spain, the stature of St. Maurice had reached immense proportions. Charlemagne, the grandson of Charles Martel and the most distinguished representative of the Carolinian dynasty, attributed to St. Maurice the virtues of the perfect Christian warrior. In token of victory, Charlemagne had the lance of St. Maurice, a replica of the holy lance reputed to have pierced the side of Christ, carried before the Frankish army. Like the general populace, which strongly relied on St. Maurice for intercession, the Carolinian dynasty prayed to this military saint for the strength to resist and overcome attacks by enemy forces. In 962, Otto I chose Maurice as the title patron of the Archbishopric of Magdeburg, Germany. By 1000 CE, the worship of Maurice was only rivaled by St. George and St. Michael. After the second half of the 12th century, the emperors were appointed by the Pope in front of the altar of St. Maurice in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. In Halle, Germany, a monastery with a school attached to it was founded and dedicated to St. Maurice in 1184. 
In 1240, a splendid Africoid statue of St. Maurice was placed in the majestic cathedral of Magdeburg. The facial characteristics of the statue are described as follows. The relatively small opening in the closely fitting male quaff was sufficient for the Magdeburg sculptor to produce a convincing characterization of St. Maurice as an African. The facial proportions show typical alterations in comparison with European physiognomy. The broad rounded contours of the nose are recognizable although the tip has been broken off. The African features are emphasized by the surviving remains of the old polychromy. The skin is colored bluish black, the lips are red, and the dark pupils stand out clearly against the white of the eyeballs. The golden chain mail of the quaff serves in turn to form a sharp contrast with the dark face. A center of extreme devotion to St. Maurice was developed in the Baltic states where merchants in Tallinn and Riga adopted his iconography. The House of the Black Heads of Riga, for instance, possessed a polychromed wooden statue of St. Maurice. Their seal bore the distinct image of a Moor's head. In 1479, Ernest built several castles, one of which he named after St. Moritz, the Moritzburg. Under a banner emblazoned with the image of a black St. Maurice, the political and religious leaders of the Holy Roman Empire battled the Slavs. The cult of St. Maurice reached its most lavish heights under Cardinal Albert of Bradenburg, 1490-1545, who established a pilgrimage at Halle in honor of the black saint. Between 1523 and 1540, people from throughout the empire journeyed to Halle to worship the relics of St. Maurice. The existence of nearly 300 major images of the black St. Maurice have been cataloged and even today the veneration of St. Maurice remains alive in numerous cathedrals in eastern Germany. Sir Morien, Black Knight Few documents portray the ethnicity of the Moors in medieval Europe with more passion, boldness, and clarity than Morien. Morien is a metrical romance rendered into English prose from the medieval Dutch version of the Lancelot. In the Lancelot, it occupies more than 5,000 lines and forms the ending of the first extant volume of that compilation. Neither the date of the original poem or the name of the author is known. The Dutch manuscript is dated to the beginning of the 14th century. The whole work is a translation and apparently a very faithful translation of a French original. It is quite clear that the Dutch compiler understood his text well and though possibly somewhat fettered by the requirement of turning prose into verse, he renders it with uncommon fidelity. Morien is the adventure of a splendidly heroic Moorish knight, possibly a Christian convert, supposed to have lived during the days of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Morien is described as follows. He was all black, even as I tell ye. His head, his body, and his hands were all black, saving only his teeth. His shield and his armor were even those of a Moor, and black as a raven. Initially in the adventure, Morien is simply called the Moor. He first challenges, then battles, and finally wins the unqualified respect and admiration of Sir Lancelot. In addition, Morien is extremely forthright and articulate. Sir Gawain, whose life was saved on the battlefield by Sir Morien, is stated to have hearkened and smiled at the Black Knight's speech. It is noted that Morien was as black as pitch. That was the fashion of his land. Moors are black as burnt brands. But in all that men would praise in a knight, was he fair after his kind. Though he were black, what was he the worse? And again, his teeth were white as chalk, otherwise was he altogether black. Morien, who was black of face and limb, was a great warrior, and it is said that his blows were so mighty, did a spear fly towards him, to harm him, it troubled him no whit. But he smote it in twain as if it were a reed, nought might endure before him. 
ultimately and ironically, Morian came to personify all of the finest virtues of the knights of medieval Europe. According to Gerald Massey, Morian is said to have been the architect of Stonehenge. Now, as a Negro is still known as a Morian in English, may not this indicate that Morian belonged to the black race, the Kushite builders? It should be noted that for a very long period the Dutch language used Moor and Morian for black Africans. Among the Lorma community in modern Liberia, the name Morian is still prominent. The expulsion from Spain and the dispersal of the Moors. In Iberia, Christian pressures on the Moors grew irresistible. Finally, in 1492, Granada, the last important Muslim stronghold in Al-Andalus, was taken by the soldiers of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, and the Moors were expelled from Spain. In 1496, to appease Isabella, King Manuel of Portugal announced a royal decree banishing the Moors from that portion of the peninsula. The Spanish king, Philip III, expelled the remaining Moors by a special decree issued in 1609. Fully 3.5 million Moors, or Moriscos as their descendants were called, left Spain between 1492 and 1610. Over a million Moors settled in France, others moved into Holland. A very curious story in the Netherlands is that of Zwarte Piet, Black Peter. By some accounts, Zwarte Piet, the companion to Santa Claus, or Santa Claus, was a Moorish orphan boy whom Santa Claus adopted and trained as his assistant. By 1507, there were numerous Moors at the court of King James the Fourth of Scotland. One of them was called Helenor in the court accounts, possibly Ellen Moore, who reached Edinburgh by way of the port of Leith and acted a principal role in the Tournament of the Black Knight and the Black Lady in which the King of Scotland played the part of the Black Knight. There were at least two other black women of the royal court who held positions of some status, and they are stated as having had maidservants dress them in expensive gowns. There is also a reference in 1569 to the payment of clothes for Niger the Moor. In 1596, Queen Elizabeth, highly distressed at the growing Moorish presence in England, wrote to the Lord Mayors of the major cities that there are of late diverse blackamoors brought into this realm, of which kind of people they are already too many, considering how God hath blessed this land with great increase of people of our nation as any country in the world. Her instructions were that these kind of people should be sent forth from the land. She repeated this later in the year, saying that these kind of people may be well spared in this realm, being so populous. Appendix The African Presence in Early Arabia A summary account of the Moors in antiquity would be incomplete without at least a brief overview of the African presence in early Arabia. The Arabian Peninsula, first inhabited more than 8,000 years ago, was early populated by blacks. Once dominant over the entire peninsula, the African presence in early Arabia is most clearly traceable through the Sabians. The Sabians were the first Arabians to step firmly within the realm of civilization. The southwestern corner of the peninsula was their early home. This area, which was known to the Romans as Arabia Felix, is today called Yemen. In antiquity, this region gave rise to a high degree of civilization because of the fertility of the soil, the growth of frankincense and myrrh, and the close proximity to the sea and consequently its importance in the trade routes. The Sabians have even been called the Phoenicians of the Southern Seas. We hear of the Sabians in the 10th century BC through the fabled exploits of its semi-legendary queen. This woman had all the qualities of an exceptional monarch and appears to have ruled over a wealthy domain embracing parts of both Africa and Arabia. She is known as Bilkis in the Koran, Makeda in the Kebra Nagast, and the Queen of Sheba in the Bible. 
The three of these documents provide a relatively clear picture of a highly developed state distinguished by the pronounced overall status of women. Bilkis Makeda was not an isolated phenomenon. Several times, in fact, do we hear of prominent women in Arabian history. The documents they are mentioned in providing no commentary on husbands, consorts, or male relatives. Either their deeds or inheritance, perhaps both, enabled them to stand out quite singularly. The Sabians apparently possessed a dedicated matrifocal culture and society. Around the beginning of the first millennium BC, the period in which Bilkis Makeda is thought to have lived, we find the emergence of a number of large urban centers characterized by elaborate irrigation systems. With the domestication of the camel, the southern Arabians could effectively exploit the region's greatest natural resources, frankincense and myrrh, which from the earliest historical periods were much prized and sought after. The purest and most abundant sources of frankincense and myrrh were in southern Arabia and Somalia, just across the Red Sea. We hear of the Sabians during the reign of the powerful Assyrian king Sargon II, 721 to 705 BC, in a series of inscriptions detailing Assyrian military successes. There is specific mention of Piriru, the king of Musru, Samsi, the queen of Arabia, Itamra, the Sabine. These are the kings of the seashore and from the desert. I received as their presence gold in the form of dust, precious stones, ivory, ebony seeds, all kind of aromatic substances, horses, and camels. It was during the 7th century BC that the Sabian rulers became known as Mukaribs, priest kings. This new form of government may well represent the accelerating Semitization of Arabia. The earliest known Sabian construction projects, including the mighty Marib Dam, South Arabia's most enduring technical achievement, were initiated during this period. Two Makaribs, Sumhu Ale Yanif and Yithi Amara Bayim, cut deep water courses through the solid rock at the south end of the site. The Marib Dam, which served its builders and their descendants for more than a thousand years, was traditionally believed to have been conceived by Lachman, the sage and multi-genius of pre-Islamic South Arabia. In effect, the dam was an earthen ridge stretching slightly more than 1,700 feet across a prominent wadi. Both sides sloped sharply upward, with the dam's upstream side fortified by small pebbles established in mortar. The Marib Dam was rebuilt several times by piling more earth and stone onto the existing structure. The last recorded height of the Marib Dam was slightly more than 45 feet. Although the Marib Dam has now practically disappeared, the huge sluice gates built into the rocky walls of the wadi are very well preserved. They continue to stand as silent but effective witnesses to the creative genius of the South Arabian people. When the periodic but powerful rains did come, the mechanism divided the onrushing waters into two channels, which ultimately sustained the area's inhabitants. Such was the force generated by the turbulent waters, however, that the Marib Dam was periodically washed out. Reconstruction was a formidable task. In one such operation, 20,000 workmen were employed, some of them coming from hundreds of miles away. At some point during this period, perhaps even earlier, there is evidence of South Arabian settlement in Ethiopia's Tigra province. The remains of actual South Arabian settlements have been found principally at Yiha, Matara, and Hatuli. The resulting commingling of Ethiopian and Sabian cultures led to the development of the powerful African kingdom of Aksum. The earliest Ethiopian alphabet is of a South Arabian type. The Aksumite script itself is apparently a derivative of Sabian. Even the name Abyssinia is thought to have been taken from Habashan, a powerful southwestern Arabian family that eventually settled in Africa. 
From this period, Ethiopia became known in Arabic scripts as Habashat and its citizens Habshi. This early Ethiopian Sabian era, beginning during the early 5th century BC, lasted a century. As the scepter of South Arabian supremacy passed from Sabah's grasp and also Ma'in, an early rival of Sabah and apparently governed by a grand council, Kataban, another regional state, emerged as the area's foremost power. Timna, one of the more archaeologically explored sites in South Arabia, was Kataban's capital and its major urban center. Kataban reached its zenith around 60 BC and right afterwards went into a period of rapid eclipse. The power in South Arabia then shifted back towards Saba in the west, albeit in a lesser form, and Hadramaut in the east, which occupied and destroyed Timna. The kingdom of Asan, a lesser known state, also became distinct at this time. Asan had such extensive commercial ties with Africa that in the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea, circa 75, the entire East African seaboard is known as the Oceanic Coast. Following the rise of Aksum, Africans assumed a highly aggressive role in Ethiopian-South Arabian relations. Around 195, for example, the Ethiopian king Gadara appears as the most dominant figure in South Arabia. A century later, the Ethiopian king Asba dispatched military contingents to South Arabia and afterwards sent Ethiopian soldiers as actual settlers. Saba was again occupied by Ethiopia from 335 to 370. The effects of this occupation were perhaps more significant than those preceding it, in that this one firmly implanted Christianity on South Arabian soil, with the Sabian rulers themselves adopting the Christian faith. Christianity had already made considerable inroads in Arabia, as is evidenced by the attendance in 325 of six Arabian bishops at the historic Council of Nicaea. Christianity was to play a critical role in the remaining years of pre-Islamic Arabia. Initially, for example, the Christian church suppressed the burning of incense during religious rituals by deeming it a pagan tradition and consequently an impediment to Christianity itself. After a brief resurgence of Sabian power under the leadership of Malik Karib Yuhadin, South Arabia, which in addition to its Christian population had attracted large numbers of Jews, witnessed an increasingly antagonistic relationship between the two religions and their adherents. The result was a violent period of Christian persecutions and church burnings. This especially virulent epoch of Christian martyrdom provoked a strong response in Ethiopia, then headed by Ella Asbeha, known as a formidable advocate of Christian enlightenment. It is said, in fact, that a total of seven different Christian saints lived under Ella Asbeha's generous patronage. In 524, a powerful coalition composed of the Eastern Roman Empire, Christian refugees from South Arabia and the Kingdom of Aksum was organized for the specific purpose of invading South Arabia and unseating its ruling class. Byzantium supplied the ships, South Arabian refugees, the advance guard, and the Aksumites, the bulk of the fighting forces. The coalition soon achieved its goals, and in the book of Himyarites and the martyrdom of Aretheus, we read of a decisive battle along the southern Arabian coast where the South Arabian king literally lost his head. After a period of seven months, Ella Aspeha returned to Africa, leaving behind him a joint government of the South Arabian nobility and the Ethiopian military. This arrangement lasted until 532 when Abreha, a junior Ethiopian military officer, seized the South Arabian throne. The 3,000-man Ethiopian army sent to suppress the revolt quickly defected to Abreha. A second expeditionary force was rapidly and soundly smashed. Abreha's stunning success was apparently facilitated by the deep class contradictions within Ethiopian society, including the military, creating a base from which a junior officer could rise to become one of the major personalities in early Arabian history. 
Although officially acknowledging Ethiopia's overall supremacy, Abreha worked unceasingly to strengthen South Arabia's autonomy, helping extend its influence into the northern and central portions of the Arabian Peninsula. After his death in 558, Abreha's exploits were recorded and embellished in Arabian, Byzantine, and Ethiopian literature, and no history of pre-Islamic Arabia is complete without him. One of the most illustrious single figures in pre-Islamic Arabia was Antar, circa 525 to 615. Graham W. Irwin notes that there has always been a considerable population in Arabia of African origin. Perhaps the most famous of these people was Antara. He had an Arab father and an Ethiopian mother and became in time the national hero of the Arabs. That's not too strong a statement. There was nobody to equal the valor and strength of Antara. He's rather like King Arthur in the English tradition, but in fact more important because he was a more historical figure. Before the advent of Islam, Southern Arabia already possessed, as we have emphasized, large and influential Christian and Jewish communities. She also possessed the sacred Kaaba sanctuary with its black stone at Makkah. Makkah was considered a holy place and the destination of pilgrims long before Muhammad. At the same time, Alat, the Arabian goddess supreme, was worshipped at Taif, in Makkah's immediate proximity. Alat may have been regarded as the ultimate reality in female form. She was worshipped in the form of an immense uncut block of granite, as firm as the earth she represented. The most solemn oaths were sworn to Alat, beginning with the words, by the salt, by the fire, and by Alat, who is the greatest of all. Another significant Arabian deity, Du al Shara, was represented by a quadrangular block of black stone. It was in this rich religious tradition that the Prophet Muhammad, who was to unite the whole of Arabia, was born. The seeds of Islam were already ripe and Africa was instrumental in its growth. According to tradition, the first Muslim killed in battle was Mujda, a black man. Another black man, Balal, was such a pivotal figure in the development of Islam that he has been referred to as a third of the faith. Many of the earliest Muslim converts were Africans, and a number of the Muslim faithful sought refuge in Ethiopia because of Arabian hostility to Muhammad's teachings. Five years after the proclamation of Islam, 615, a number of Muslims sought refuge in neighboring Ethiopia in order to escape the persecutions of the Curiosites in Mecca. Their sojourn in Ethiopia greatly impressed these early Muslim migrants and influenced the future development of their new faith. Muslim biographical sources, Tabakat, enumerate not a few Ethiopian converts to Islam who migrated to Medina and ranked amongst the Prophet's companions. They were referred to as the Ethiopian monks, Ruban al-Habasha. It was this relationship which caused Muhammad to declare that who brings an Ethiopian man or an Ethiopian woman into his house brings the blessing of God there. Another eminent black man, Ata ibn Abi Rabah, circa 700, became a mufti at Maka. He was born in southern Arabia of Nubian parents. Eventually he moved to Maka and became a famous teacher and jurist consultant there. In his later years, his reputation spread far and wide. According to some accounts, including the brilliant black writer and historian Uthman Amir Abin Bar al-Jaziz, the Prophet Muhammad himself was partly of African lineage. According to al-Jahiz, the guardian of the sacred Kaaba, Abd al-Mutalib, fathered ten lords, black as the night and magnificent. One of these men was Abdallah, the father of Muhammad. The end of Moors in Antiquity. Please support this channel by clicking on the links below. The Empire of the Moors by John G. Jackson. The Moors were people who lived in Morocco. That's the reason they called it that. The word Moor meant black. It meant black people. 
In ancient times, all Africans were called Ethiopians or Cushites. And in the Middle Ages, the Africans were called Moors. The word Moor literally means black, so the Moorish people were the black people. In medieval times, the name Moor was not restricted to the inhabitants of Morocco, but it was customary to refer to all Africans as Moors. The highly ambiguous word Negro had not yet been invented. The word Negro came up when the slave trade came in. In other words, you have a lot of little fish floating around in the ocean. They're little fish and they have various names. But if you put them in cans, they all become sardines. So when they put the black man in slavery, he became a Negro. We know from the contemporary records which have come down to us from the era of medieval Moorish supremacy that the Moors did not consider themselves as white men. The Moors in North Africa were converted to Islam during the 7th century. An army of 12,000 Africans was recruited and placed under the leadership of the Moorish general Tariq. Tarif was an officer in Tariq's army. He led the first expedition to Spain to find out what the Moors had to face. The army landed at a place later named Tarifa in honor of Tarif. He set up a custom house there. He found out that they had no serious opposition to face in Spain. Tarif and his small detachment plundered Algeciras and other towns and returned to Africa with their boats loaded with spoils. There was a kingdom of the Visigoths, the Western Goths. There was a Greek governor in a place called Sielta on the African coast. The story is that Count Julian, the Greek governor, sent his daughter on a vacation to visit King Roderick and he raped his daughter. Julian persuaded the Moors to invade Spain because he said it was unprotected. All they had to do was walk in and take it. General Tariq and his army landed on an isthmus between an encampment then called Mons Calpe and the continent of Europe. After that, Mons Calpe was renamed Gebel Tariq, the Hill of Tariq, or as we now call it, Gibraltar. Tariq's African army captured a number of Spanish towns near Gibraltar, among them Heraclea. Then he advanced northward into Andalusia. The Visigothic King Roderick learned of the invasion and raised an immense army for the defense of Spain. The two opposing armies met in a battle near Xeres, not far from the Guadalete River. After overrunning most of the Iberian Peninsula, the Moors pushed on through to France, where they were repulsed with heavy losses at Poitiers by the Franks under Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne. After this significant setback, they retired into Spain and there laid the foundations of a new civilization. The country was immeasurably enriched by their labors. They, for instance, introduced the silk industry into Spain. In the field of agriculture, they were highly skilled and introduced rice, sugar cane, dates, ginger, cotton, lemons, and strawberries into the country. The Spanish city of Cordova in the 10th century was very much like a modern city. Its streets were well paved and there were raised sidewalks for pedestrians. At night, one could walk for 10 miles by the light of lamps, flanked by an uninterrupted extant of buildings. This was hundreds of years before there was a paved street in Paris, France, or a street lamp in London. The population of Cordova was over a million. There were 200,000 homes, 800 public schools, and many colleges and universities. Cordova possessed 10,000 palaces of the wealthy, besides many royal palaces surrounded by beautiful gardens. There were even 5,000 mills in Cordova at a time when there was not even one in the rest of Europe. There were also 900 public baths, beside a large number of private ones, at a time when the rest of Europe considered bathing as extremely sinful and to be avoided as much as possible. Cordova was also graced by a system of over 4,000 public markets. The Great Mosque of Cordova, another grand structure, had a scarlet and gold roof with 1,000 columns of porphyry and marble. It was lit by more than 200 silver chandeliers containing more than 1,000 silver lamps burning perfumed oil. The marvelous cities of Toledo, Seville, and Grenada were rivals of Cordova in respect to grandeur and magnificence. According to D. Fontenelle, the Moors of Grenada, a small black people, burned by the sun, 
full of wit and fire, always in love, writing verse, fond of music, arranging festivals, dances, and tournaments every day. Education was universal in Moorish Spain, being given to the most humble, while in Christian Europe, 99% of the people were illiterate, and even kings could neither read nor write. You had Moorish women who were doctors and lawyers and professors. Jewish scholars studied under the Moors and then went to England and set up a scientific school at what later came to be Oxford University. The Moors furnished the knowledge and the Jews collected it. The Jews were intermediaries. The Moors and Christians were fighting each other and the Jews formed a bridge between them. The Omeyyad dynasty survived in Spain until 1031 but it was obviously in a state of decline by the year 1000. Abd ur Rahman III, one of the greatest of the Moorish monarchs, reigned for 50 years, 911 to 961, and both stabilized and expanded the territories of his dominions. The Moors were a very tolerant people. The Moorish rulers lived in sumptuous palaces, while the monarchs of Germany, France, and England dwelt in big barns with no windows and no chimneys and with only a hole in the roof for the exit of smoke. In the year 1048, the Emir Yahya of Morocco visited Mecca. Here he met a religious reformer, Ibn Yasin, whom he persuaded to return home with him to teach his doctrines to the Moors. Ibn Yasin, with a few followers, set his headquarters on an island in the Senegal River in West Africa. The new movement proved to be popular, and the leader named his disciples Moabites, champions of the faith, which in time was changed to al Moravide. A crusade was urged by Ibn Yasin, the purpose of which to maintain the truth, to repress injustice, and to abolish all taxes not based on law. The leadership of the al Moravides, which started in Upper Senegal, was assumed by the Emir Yahya, after consolidating his position in southwestern Morocco, Yahya died in 1056 and was succeeded by his brother, Abu Bekr, who led his armies to further victories. Abu Bekr retired to southern Morocco and turned over the northern part of the country to his cousin, Yusuf Tachafin, who soon became the master of northwest Africa. In the year 1062, Yusuf laid the foundation of the town of Morocco with his own hands. By the year 1082, he had long been the supreme ruler of that portion of the world. When therefore he consented to cross over to Spain, and in the course of time drove back the Christians and established once more a supreme sultan upon the throne of Andalusia, his conquest and the dynasty which he founded must be regarded as an African conquest and an African dynasty. When Yusuf I crossed over to Europe, he was in command of an army of 15,000 men, armed mainly with swords and poniards. But his shock troops were a 6,000 strong detachment of Senegalese cavalrymen mounted on white Arabian horses, said to be fleet as the wind. Once in Spain, Yusuf was met by the chief rulers of Spain, the kings of Almeria, Bajajos, Grenada, and Seville. The Moorish army, only 10,000 men in all, joined the African forces of Yusuf and marched northward to join battle with King Alfonso VI, who headed a Christian army of 70,000. The opposing armies battled each other at Zalaka in October 1086, and at first the Christian host seemed to be winning, al Mutumed leading the Muslims had three horses killed under him, and, though wounded, kept his men in line until Yusuf came up with reinforcements and attacked the Christians from the rear. In the early part of the 12th century, another religious reformer, calling himself the Mahdi, appeared in Morocco. He named his followers al Mohades, Unitarians. After the conquest of Morocco in 1147, when the last Almoravide king was dethroned and executed, the Almohades seized the reins of government and then invaded Europe. By 1150, they had defeated the Christian armies of Spain and placed an Almohade sovereign on the throne of Moorish Spain 
and thus, for the second time, a purely African dynasty ruled over the most civilized portion of the Iberian Peninsula. Under a great line of Almohade kings, the splendor of Moorish Spain was not only maintained but enhanced, for they erected the Castile of Gibraltar in 1160 and began the building of the Great Mosque of Seville in 1183. The Giralda of Seville was originally an astronomical observatory constructed in 1196 under the supervision of the mathematician Jaber. The Almoravides had established a Spanish court in Seville. The Almohades set up an African court in the city of Morocco, and Ibn Said in the 13th century describes Morocco as the Baghdad of the West and says that under the early Almohade rulers, the city enjoyed its greatest prosperity. In the early part of the 13th century, the Moorish power in Spain began to decline. Unfortunately, the Muslims, due to religious and political differences, began to split into factions and wage war among themselves. At the same time, the Christians of Europe, having absorbed the science and culture of the Moors, which enabled them to bring to an end the long night of the Dark Ages began to form a united front in order to drive the Moors back into Africa. The dominions of the Almohades were slowly but surely captured by the Christian armies, and after almost a century of brilliant achievement, the Almohade dynasty was ended when their last reigning sovereign was deprived of his throne in the year 1230. Muslim Spain declared independence under the rule of Ibn Hud, the founder of the Hudite dynasty. The Christian forces, in the meantime, conquered one great city after another, taking Valencia in 1238, Cordova in 1239, and Seville in 1260. By 1492, the Moors had lost all Spain except the Kingdom of Granada. The Christians, although not free from internal disputes, were finally united by the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, which joined in peace the formerly hostile royal houses of Aragon and Castile. The United Christian forces surrounded the city of Grenada and blockaded it for eight months. The Moorish king, Abu Abdallah, also known as Boabdil, finally surrendered. The Moors lingered in Spain for a little more than a century. By 1610, through expulsion and migration, a million among the many Jews had returned to northern Africa and western Europe. The expulsion of the Moors from Andalusia was a serious setback to modern civilization. The true greatness of Moorish culture is not generally known even to the educated classes of the western world. The standard work on the Moors is the three-volume History of the Moorish Empire in Europe by S. P. Scott. One of the very best studies of the contributions of the Moors to world history is the one-volume edition, The Story of the Moors in Spain, by Stanley Lane Poole. It was published in London and New York in 1886. Lane Poole was English and was professor of Arabic at the University of Dublin. Of the conquest and expulsion of the Moors, Lane Poole wrote, in 1492, the last bulwark of the Moors gave way before the crusade of Ferdinand and Isabella, and with Grenada fell all Spain's greatness. For a brief while, indeed, the reflection of the Moorish splendor cast a borrowed light upon the history of the land which it had once warmed with its sunny radiance. The great epoch of Isabella, Charles V, and Philip II of Columbus, Cortes, and Pizarro shed a last halo about the dying moments of a mighty state. Then followed the abomination of desolation, the rule of the Inquisition, and the blackness of darkness in which Spain has plunged ever since. Some anthropologists have assigned the Moors to an arbitrary brown race, and others have labeled them dark whites. Joseph McCabe once observed that perhaps an African anthropologist we call the same people pale blacks. Even the Arabs, who were always a minority in the so-called Arab culture of the Middle Ages, regarded a dark complexion as a badge of honor. Arnold J. Toynbee noted that the primitive Arabs, who were the ruling element of the Umayyad Caliphate, called themselves the Swarthy people, 
with a connotation of racial superiority and their Persian and Turkish subjects, the ruddy people, with a connotation of racial inferiority. That is to say, they drew the distinction that we draw between blondes and brunettes, but reversed the value. The curious idea that a great white race has been responsible for all the great civilizations of the past is nothing more than a crude superstition propagated mainly by European-oriented racist historians. <laughs>